section number thirty of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l perretz translated by helena frank section thirty lyashtazulf i arrived in lyashtazulf on a dark summer night between eleven and twelve o'clock another market-place with various buildings and little walled-in houses round about in the middle of the market-place a collection of large white stones i drive nearer the stones move and grow horns they become a herd of milk-white goats the goats show more sense than the heads of the community of tishewitz they are not frightened one or two out of the whole lot have lifted their heads looked at us sleepily and once more turned their attention to the scanty grass of the gas and to scratching one the other happy goats no one calumniates you you needn't be afraid of statisticians it is true people kill you but what then does not every one die before his time and as far as troubles go you certainly have fewer i recall what i was told in tishowitz in lyashtazel you will get on better and faster the people are sensible quieter no one will run after you kohol and the goat seem to be equally admirable one like the other but my host an old friend is not encouraging he says it will not be so easy as people think what will you do he asks go from house to house what else i wish they may be civil why shouldn't they be a jew hates having his money-box opened and the contents counted why so won't the blessing enter in afterwards no it isn't that the misfortune is that the credit will go out End of section 30. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Section 31 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l perretz translated by helena frank section thirty one travel pictures the first attempt early in the morning before the arrival of the beetle there come some jews they want to see the note-taker my fame has preceded me i make a beginning and turn to one of them good morning friend good morning shom achem he gives me his hand quite lazily what is your name friend levi yitzchuk and your german name why do you want to know well is it a secret secret or no secret you may as well tell me why you want to know i'll be bound that's no secret then you don't know it not exactly make a shot at it just for fun baron plaltz he answers a little ashamed a wife eat what does eat mean he wants a divorce another answers for him how many children he has to think and counts on his fingers by the first wife mine one two three hers one two by the second wife 
he is tired of counting let us say six let us say it's no good i must know exactly you see exactly is not so easy exactly why do you want to know whose is are you an official do they pay you for it will somebody follow and check your statements exactly tell blockhead tell the rest encourage him now you've begun tell they want to know what the next question will be once again he has counted on his fingers and heaven be praised there are three more nine children health and strength to them how many sons how many daughters he counts again four sons and five daughters how many sons and how many daughters married you want to know that too look here tell me why tell him then tell him cried the rest impatiently three daughters and two sons answers someone for the question tacky says the latter and yesurlik but he isn't married yet horse they call him up next sabbath what does a week and a half matter i make a note and ask further have you served in the army i bought exemption from kohol for four hundred roubles where should i find them now and he groans and your sons the eldest has a swelling below his right eye and has besides not of you be it said a rupture he has been in three hospitals it costs more than a wedding they only just sent him home from the regiment the second drew a high number the third is serving his time now and the wife at home with me of course need you ask she might have been at her father's a pauper have you a house have i a house worth how much if it were in samarcas it would be worth something here it's not worth a drear except i have a place to lay my hat down in would you sell it for one hundred roubles preserve us one's own inheritance not for three hundred would you give it for five hundred me i should hire a lodging and apply myself to some business and what is your business now what business what do you live on that's what you mean oh just lives on what god's providence when he gives something one has it but he doesn't throw things down from heaven he does so can i tell how i live let us reckon i need a lot of money at least four roubles a week the house yields besides my own lodging twelve roubles a year nine go in taxes five in repairs leaves a hole in the pocket of two roubles a year that's it he puts on airs heaven be praised i have no money neither i nor any one of the jews standing here nor any other jews except perhaps the german ones in the big towns we have no money i don't know any trade my grandfather never sewed a shoe therefore i live as god wills and have lived so for fifty years and if there is a child to be married we have a wedding and dance in the mud once and for all what are you a jew what do you do all day i study i pray what else should a jew do and when i have eaten i go to the market what do you do in the market what do i do whatever turns up 
well yesterday for example i heard as i passed that yonnick borick wanted to buy three rams for a gentleman before daylight i was at the house of a second gentleman who had once said he had too many rams i made an agreement with yonnick borick and heaven be praised we made a rouble and a half by it are you then what is called a commission agent how should i know sometimes it even occurs to me to buy a bit of produce sometimes what do you mean sometimes when i have a rouble i buy and why not i get one how what do you mean by how and it is an hour before i find out that levi yitschok barnaplets is a bit of rabbinical assistant and acts as arbiter in quarrels a bit of a commission agent a fragment of a merchant a morsel of a matchmaker and now and again when fancy takes him a messenger thanks to all these trades the counted and the forgotten ones he earns his bread although with toil and trouble for wife and child even for the married daughter because her father-in-law is but a pauper end of section 31 recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section 32 of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l perretz translated by helena frank section thirty two travel pictures the second attempt i am taken into a shop a few packets of matches a few boxes of cigarettes needles pins hairpins buttons green and yellow soap a few pieces of home-made fragrant soap a few grocery wares who lives here i ask you can see for yourself answers a jewish woman and goes on combing the hair of a little girl about ten years old who has twitched her head from under the comb and stares with great astonished eyes at the goy who talks yiddish lay your head down again screams the mother what is the name of your husband i inquire moshi and his german name may his name come home she scolds suddenly he has been four hours getting a dish from the neighbors stop scolding says the beetle and answer when you're spoken to she is afraid of the beetle he is beetle and bailiff together and collects the taxes besides being held in great regard by the town's justice who was scolding who what can't i speak against my own husband what is his german name i ask again the beetle remembers it himself and answers jungfreud how many children have you i beg of you friend come later on when my husband is here that's his affair i've enough to do with the shop and six children go away for goodness sake i make a note of six children and ask how many are married married i wish any of them were married i should have fewer gray hairs are they all girls three are boys what are they doing plaguing my life out with their open mouths why not teach them a trade she turns up her nose gives me a black look and refuses to give any further answers i have an idea 
I buy a pack of cigarettes. She looks less disagreeable, and I ask, How much does your husband earn? He? He earn anything? What use do you suppose he is, when I can't even send him to fetch a dish from a neighbor's? He's been four hours already. It won't be thanks to him if we get any supper tonight. She goes off into another fury. I have to go outside and catch the husband in the street. I knew him. He was carrying a dish. End of section 32. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Section number 33 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Pertez. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 33. Travel Pictures at the Chauchettes. I am greeted by a mixture of different voices. A hero of a cock gives a proud crow, as though there were no such thing as a slaughter knife in the world contrariwise a calf lows sadly it would seem to be hungry while between the boards under the holes in the tall roof chirp quantities of small birds they have wings and laugh at the chauchette it is summer the air is full of insects men even the poorest and the stingiest leave crumbs about zip zip and zip and zip 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 the bed in the nest is made the he is decked out in bright colors the she is modest and silent and the children have had enough to eat they are warm and are not down in someone's notebook for military service or in connection with the matter of a license but ask them what is the meaning of a blemish in the holy offerings this question is being discussed by two young men barefoot in skull caps and undressed to their little prayer scarfs the young men are only unfit for inspecting licenses or wares in the shop but calves for the altar as fast as you please when god portioned out the world the peasant took the soil the fisher the river the hunter the forest the gardener the fruit trees the merchant the weights and measures and so on but the poet lingered in a wood the nightingale sang to him the trees whispered all sorts of wood gossip into his ear and his eyes the poetical eyes could not look away from the girl kneeling by the stream from the tadpole in her hand and he came too late for everything the world when he arrived was already divided up god had nothing left for him but clouds rainbows roses and songbirds he did not even find the young washerwoman on his way back she had engaged herself somewhere as a nurse you have fancy create a world for yourself said god and people envied the poet his world was the best the peasant tilled his land with sweat and toil the fisher is not idle breaking ice in winter time is no joke the hunter wearies hunting and pursuing pippins are not so easily made out of crab apples the merchant must bestir himself if only about falsifying the weights and measures else he dies of hunger one is the poet who lies on his stomach and creates worlds 
but it was a mistake it turned out that his soul was only a camera obscura that reflected the outside world with all its mud and pigs so long as the pig kept keeps its place it is not so bad but when the pig gets into the foreground the poet's world becomes as piggish as ours the only people who remain to be envied are our two young men the shoshet son with the shoshet son-in-law our world with its pigs doesn't fit in with their world of blemish in the sacrifice there is no connection between the two no bridge no link whatever and as i have come into their world out of our world the gemorias are shut while the young faces express fear and wonder the show set is not at home he has gone to a neighboring village that is why the calf is still lowing in the house the wife has a little draper's shop the daughter and a daughter-in-law stand by the fire and their faces are triply red first from pride in their husbands with their torah secondly from the crackling fire and thirdly with confusion before a stranger a man and a german to boot one caught a corner of her apron in her mouth the other moved a few steps backward as in the synagogue at the end of the kadusha both look at me in astonishment from under low foreheads with hairbands of plaited thread the young men however soon recovered themselves they have heard of the note-taker and have guessed that i am he the note-taking goes quickly the shoshet gets four roubles a week besides what he earns in the villages were it not for the meat brought in from the villages round about he would be doing very well the shop does not bring in much but always something par nasa thank god they have as for the children they will live with the parents and when in god's good time the parents shall have departed this life they will inherit one the father's profession the other the shop the house will be in common they look better off than any in the town better off than the traders householders workmen better off even than the public housekeeper and the feldsher together there will come a time i think as i go out when even teaching will be one of the best paid professions it is all not so bad as people think besides being a rabbi a chaussette a beadle and a teacher there is yet another good way of getting a living in the chaussette's house there is a female lodger she pays fifteen roubles a year the door is locked through the window which looks into the street i see quite a nice little room two well-furnished beds with white pillows red painted wood furniture copper utensils hang on the wall by the fireplace there is a bright hanging lamp the room is full of comfort and household cheer she has silver too they tell me i see a large chest with brass fittings there must be silver candlesticks in it and perhaps ornaments what do you think they say she has a lot of money the whole town is in her pocket she is a widow with three children the door is locked all through the week because she only comes home every sabbath except shibbiz shazon she spends the whole week going round the villages in the neighborhood begging with all three children
End of section 33. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Section 34 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank section thirty four travel pictures the rebetson of skull esther the queen was sallow but a gleam of graciousness lighted up her countenance esther the skull rebetson was also plain-featured but it was not a gleam rather a sun of kindliness that shone in her face an old thin woman her head covered with a thin wrinkled pale pink skin droops like a fine s rogue over her red kerchief only this s rogue has two kind serious eyes she is a native of the place and lives by herself she has married all her children in various parts of the country but nothing would induce her to live with any one of them she is never advisable to let oneself be dependent on a son-in-law or daughter-in-law the husband stands up for the wife the wife for the husband not without reason saith the holy torah and therefore a man shall leave his parents etc she will not give them occasion to transgress the command to honor a mother that is a real case of thou shalt not cause the blind to stumble god blessed be his name created man so that he should not see the faults of those nearest him otherwise the world would be as full of divorces as of marriage contracts secondly as the rabbi of skull observed more than once a widow who depends on her children is a double grass widow and the words of the rabbi of skull should be framed in gold and worn about the neck as an obile true she says with a low sigh obiles are not worn nowadays imitation pearls are considered prettier she could not stay on in skull since her husband the rabbi died the place has become hateful to her really she says its glory has departed its splendor and its beauty she goes there once a year for the anniversary of his death but she cannot remain long it has grown empty she lived with the skull rabbi forty years those that knew him say that she grew to be his second self he may he forgive me was a misengid so she thinks nothing of good jews his service was the torah in its plain meaning she sits all day over the pentateuch in yiddish or learns the so can aruk she quotes the skull rabbi at every second word and it is his voice his motions his customs after the skull rabbi's kiddush and havdole she will listen to no other she says her own over cake or currant wine and her kiddush or his kiddush the same low dignified chant the same sweetness she eats just kosher and is very learned she can answer ritual questions forty years running she has stood by the hearth with her kind face turned to the table at which her husband sat and studied her dove's eyes took in his every movement her ears 
half hidden under the head kerchief his every word she was his true helpmeet she hid his every thought in her brain and his goodness in her heart a river may have lain a hundred years in another bed and all its previous twists and bends are wrought into the rocks of its first one the skull's rabbi life may have run more peacefully than a river but the rebbitzin was no rock to him rather a sponge that absorbed the whole of him she is not satisfied with the world as it is to-day if it is no longer pious the almighty must have a care if his people behave so it is doubtless because he wishes it only there is no purpose in it all the present-day stuffs are spider webs and people don't sew as they used to they cut it all up into seams don't talk to me of the curtains before the ark you can't make so much as a frock for a child out of them the old-fashioned headdresses get dearer every day a headkerchief ought to last forever and even out of a bosom kerchief you can always draw a gold or silver thread but imitation pearls and glass spangles are good for nothing and believe me it is all much uglier in my opinion but she bears no one a grudge my husband the skull rabbi was a misengid but he never persecuted a chaucid heaven forbid she remembers how the householders once came crying out that the chasidim of the place were late in reciting the shima and she heard from his own lips the reply there are he said to them different armies and they have different weapons different customs but they all serve the same kingdom even boots he added with a smile are not all made by the same pattern she remembers all his sayings and lives according to his ideas he used to get very angry if a workman rose and stood before him as a sign of respect for he was greatly in favor of people working with their hands therefore when she came here with her few hundred roubles she set up soap making sooner than live on others she knows that even a woman is under the law bidding every one do something for his own support it is not one of the laws bound to a certain time from which women are exempt when they kept her money she remained dependent on the soap only it wouldn't be a bad business she says blessed be his name i make three to four roubles a week before a holiday my soap may his name be praised has a reputation in the whole neighborhood only just now it's all on credit some day the business will fail i look round on all sides i see no utensils no instruments for the work nothing extra is wanted for she gives me to understand you take some ashes from the hearth potatoes and other vegetables work them together in water let them steam and then simmer over the fire in that way you get unclear soap and if you do the same thing over again you get liter that is good soap when i leave she asks a little troubled and ashamed tell me i beg of you when your writings come into the hands of the great people will they not say i must take out a license end of section thirty four recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section thirty five of stories and pictures 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 35. Travel Pictures. Insured. A quiet summer night. Over there the celebrated wood shows black on the skyline. Our forefathers engraved in its trees the names of the divisions of the Talmud as they completed as they went along. Yonder, not far off, they halted, and the head of the dispersion said, Po Lin, here abide, and the land has ever since been called Po Lin, but the other nations cannot make out the reason. And the wood has a shortcut to Jerusalem. There was once a goat belonging to one of the native Lamed Wolfniks, and the goat knew the road. She used to trot every morning to pasture on the Temple Mount, and return with three pitcherfuls of milk for the holy man. To the right of the wood, beside a river, lies the town. It is divided into two parts. One part is a long strip, a straight paved street with walled-in houses under sheet metal roofs quite substantial fastened to the earth with foundations the inhabitants of the street know for certain that they will live and die in them that all the winds of heaven may blow without causing them to move an inch then comes the second part another world quite spiritual flimsy hen houses entirely built of straw and fir planks with only an occasional slate roof a breeze blows over them and they are gone do their dwellers hope to find the shortcut to the temple mount like the immortal goat or do they speculate on the fire insurance and how like are the houses to their inhabitants these are narrow-chested with darkened eyes and crouch under crooked straw caps cocks crow out of the huts ducks quack and geese cackle from out of the marsh which licks the threshold with seventy tongues croak well-fed portly frogs a jewish calf frequently contributes a bleat and is answered out of the long street by a genteel dog i shall begin to take notes early in the morning I know beforehand what it will be if not thirty-six roubles a year it will be thirty-three or thirty-two i shall find many trades and few blessings more soap factories any number of empty houses the beetle will reckon up for me he is a messenger she a huckstress two daughters are out in service in lublin in samox's one son is a helper in a cheddar the other serving his time in the army and the daughter-in-law with three four five children has gone home to her father and mother i shall find neglected children tumbling about in the swamp with the ducks and the geese mites of babies screaming their throats out in the cradles sick people left alone in bed boarded out children sitting over gamoras young women in furry wigs and with or without shyness i hardly shut my eyes before these same weary livid pale twisted faces walking sorrows rise before me there is seldom one who smiles one with a dimple all the men so unmanly so mummy-like women with running eyes carrying a load of fruit a sack of onions or else an unborn child together with the onions i know i shall come across an unlicensed third-rate public house two or three horse-stealers and more than 
two or three receivers of stolen goods but what about the statistics can they answer the question how many empty stomachs useless teeth how many people whose eyes are drawn out of their sockets as with pincers at the sight of a piece of dry bread how many people who have really died of hunger all you gain by statistics is that you find out about an unlicensed public house or a horse thief or a receiver of stolen goods scientific medicine has invented a machine for checking heartbeats one by one the foolish statistics play with figures do statistics record the anxious heartbeats that thumped in the breast of the grandson of the descendant from spanish ancestors or the son of the author of the tevis shore before they committed their first illegality do they measure how their hearts bled after they committed it do they count the sleepless nights before and after can they show how many were the days of hunger how many times the children flung themselves about in convulsions how often hands and feet shook when the first glass was filled by the unlicensed brandy cellar livid ghastly blue faces float before me in the empty air and blue brown parched lips whisper there has been no fire in my chimney for twenty-four days we have eaten potato peelings for ten three died without a doctor or prescription i had to save the fourth the hoarse voices cut me to the heart like a blunt knife i leave the window where i have been standing but the room is full of ghosts by the stove stands a red jew well nourished he 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 laughs steal buy stolen things a business like any other no less than a month's imprisonment in a month i would have lost a fortune all the noblemen will bear me witness honestly honestly that voice is worse it saws i throw myself on the bed i shut my eyes and there appears to me the good old rabbitson of skull well she says with her childlike silvery voice and suppose the result of your inquiries were not favorable for the jews shall you be able to say thy people are all righteous i feel as if her kind blue dove-like eyes rested soothingly on my hot forehead i fell asleep beneath them and i dreamt of the two angels the good inclination and the evil one i saw them flying earthward before daybreak enveloped in a thin pink mist the evil inclination carried in one hand a blue paper with a large black eye in the top left-hand corner evidently a deed relating to a house or some property expensive dresses besides fur caps braided caftans silk sashes also a top hat and a frock coat as if for one person also handkerchiefs head kerchiefs kerchiefs with tinsel pearl necklaces as well as silk and satin trains of all colors all that in one hand and in the other potato peelings the good inclination naked without clothes or things to carry as god made him both fly it seems as if the good inclination wanted to tell me something he opens his pretty mouth but not his voice a cry of alarm wakes me fire i spring out of bed there is a fire just opposite a long tongue of flame stretches out towards me and seems to say 
don't be frightened it's insured end of section 35 recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section number 36 of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l perretz translated by helena frank section thirty six travel pictures the fire the fiery tongue was put out at me by reb chame whitesensang's house the tongue grew larger and the house smaller till it fell in into a sea of wails and screams of terror there was fortunately no wind at the time of the conflagration when the sun rose from out of the mist blushing red like a beautiful and innocent maiden after the bath she saw nothing but long black male heads turning over the ruins with sticks they were looking for the remnants of wetenzang's riches in the remnants of his house groups of yellow-faced women are already standing around it the brown shawls are held with washed fingers over their unwashed heads and pale lips lament and bewail the house with the morning came a fresh wind a little sooner and it would have played havoc now it just shakes the remaining old chimney over the women's heads as though it were a palm the chimney rocks and groans sadly as though it felt deserted and perhaps it listens to the innkeeper telling me the tale of the destruction of the house and affirms with a nod true true you would sooner pick up every thread every dust grain of life out of which the sleep angel has woven you a fantastic dream than discover all the devices a jew must resort to before he hears the clink of copper coin if i were to describe everything you would think i had been dreaming myself who shall read the divine countenance when a wretched creature stands before him lifts its head with its racked brain extinguished eyes and trembling voice and pressing its empty stomach with cracked and bony hands prays without a voice without a language the tongue will not move but the blood cries lord of the world i have done my part now thou must help lord of the world feed me like the ravens in what am i more worthless than they are lord of the world where are my crumbs when will it be my sabbath of song and for all the body he has he might very well be a bird nothing is wanting but the wings and the nest with the crumbs and therefore the jewish parnassas are so specialized that their like will only be in the twenty-first century when one specialist will lift the upper eyelid a second press down the lower and a third examine the sick eye if a dish of roast veal a rag in a paper factory or an exported egg had a mouth to speak with and the rabbi reb heschel's memory they would still be unable to say how many jewish hands had taken them out and put them in from the peasant's shed into the roasting pan from the manure box into the hollander from the servitude into freedom and a jewish parnasse 
is just such a ladder as jacob our father saw in a dream the night when all stones united into one stone for his head a ladder standing on the earth and the top of it reaches into the sky how deep it is chained into the earth is known only to the worm at its foot and how high it reaches to the star only that shines above it we grow giddy gazing up the height and when we peer down into the depths our stomach turns and we look green forever after angels ascend and descend the ladder men alas climb it with their last remaining strength and fall down it when their strength is exhausted and even if he can thank his stars his neck is not broken the jew has no strength left to begin climbing again such is the ladder that was partially climbed by our burnt-out one first he travelled between the villages as a runner on business for other people the earth was hot to his bare feet it was not the cry of a brother's blood this cane heard it was the cry of wife and children for bread heaven came to his assistance he bought very cheaply for two or three years on end and then he was promoted from a runner to a walker there was already provision at home for a week at a time and he only came back fridays with the result of a week's bargaining the brain was more composed and had time to take in the fact that the feet were becoming swollen that the father of six children ought always to walk and not run if he wishes his feet to carry him till at least one of them is confirmed and god help further he is now blessed by the name a village peddler that is he walks only when there is no opportunity to ride in from one village to another for a kopeck if the opportunity is there he rides god help him on again another year or two and he has his own horse and cart time does not stand still and he took no rest and god help the one horse turned into two the cart into a trap and it even came to a driver and he is now a produce dealer first he deals with peasants and then with gentlemen and god helping he gets into favor first with the head of the dairy farm then with the manager after that with the bailiff after that again with the steward and at last with the count himself oh by that time he is an inhabitant settled in the place the driver becomes a domestic servant horse and carriage are sold and pockets are lined with the count's receipts what is he now he is like the sun round which circles the stars small traders and little stars brokers he shines and illuminates the whole place with credit yelkinson compared him to a spider sitting in his web and the count to one of the flies entangling in it after a while our sun spider or spider son enlarged his house wrote marriage contracts for his children settled dowries on them bought his wife pearls and himself a sealskin coat engaged better teachers for his boys and for the girls someone to teach them if only how to write a jewish letter suddenly at least for the town the count was declared bankrupt and our spider son or son spider lost everything at once if i had passed through a month earlier i should have put down a house fifteen hundred roubles a propination 
a business in timber and produce a money lender he has lent the count fifteen thousand roubles at ten per cent not as a mortgage but for hand receipts now i write one word burnt out i might add a man of eighty-two swollen feet a household of seventeen persons end of section thirty six recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section thirty seven of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Stories and Pictures by I.L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 37. The Emigrant. I open a door, a room without beds, without furniture, carpeted with hay and straw. In the middle of the room stands a barrel upside down. Round the barrel, four starved-looking children, with frowsy hair, hang over a great earthenware dish of sour milk, out of which they eat, holding a greenish metal spoon in their right hand and a bit of bran bread in their left. In one corner on the floor sits a pale woman, and the tears fall from her eyes on the potatoes she is about to peel. In the second corner lies he, also on the floor, and undressed it was no good your coming neighbor he says to me without rising no good at all i don't belong here now but when he sees that i have no intention of going away he raises himself slowly no where am i to see you he asks sadly i assure him that i can write standing you will get nothing out of me i'm only waiting for a boat ticket you see i have sold everything even my tools you are a mechanic i ask a tailor and what obliges you to emigrate hunger and there was hunger in his face in her face and still more in the gleaming eyes of the children round the barrel no work to be had he shrugged his shoulders as much as to say he and work had long been strangers where are you going to to london i was there once already and made money i sent my wife ten roubles a week and lived like a human being the bad luck brought me home again i wondered if the bad luck were his wife why not have sent for your family to join you it drew me back it's black as night over there as soon as ever i closed an eye i dreamt of the little town the river round it i felt suffocated there and it drew me and drew me this is certainly i remark a beautiful bit of country the air costs nothing and we have been living on air heaven be praised these three years this time i'm going with wife and child i mean to put an end to it you will miss the wood again the wood he gives himself a twist with a bitter smile my wife went into the wood the evening before last to gather berries and they marched her out and treated her to the whip there is the river i want to take him away from his sad thoughts his pale face grew paler the river in the summer it took one of my children i hurried away from the luckless home end of section thirty seven section thirty eight of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america stories and pictures by i l peretz translated by helena frank section thirty eight the madman i returned to my lodgings quite unnerved and lay a long time on the hard sofa without closing an eye a noise wakes me something is stealing into me through the window i see on the window ledge too long bony dirty hands and there raises itself from behind them an unkempt head with two gleaming eyes in a livid face won't you enter me asked the head softly i do not know how to answer 
he meanwhile has taken silence for consent and stands in the middle of the room alarmed and still more astonished i keep my eye on him right he says impatiently shall i give you the ink and a pen without waiting for an answer he pushes up to my sofa the little table with the writing materials write please write and his voice is so soft and gentle it finds its way into my heart and i am no longer frightened i sit up to write i question him and he answers me your name jonah your surname when i was a little boy they called me jonah zeeg after my wedding jonah drong but since the misfortune happened to me mad jonah what is your german name oh you mean that directly directly pearlman you see my pearls he points to a torn red kerchief around his neck and says real pearls ha but that's what i'm called how can i help it a wife you had better not put her down she doesn't live with me since the misfortune she doesn't live with me a nice wife too i would gladly have given her a divorce but the rabbi wouldn't allow it he said i mustn't a nice little wife and his eyes grew moist she even took the child with her it's better off with her what should i do with it carry it about they throw stones at me and would have hurt it one child is all you have one what was your misfortune may you know trouble as little as i know that folks say a devil the rofa says a stone fell into my head and the soul or as he calls it the life into my belly i don't remember the stone but i have a bruise on my head he takes off his hat and cap together bends his head and shows me a bare bump in the hair it may have been from a stone but i am mad that's certain what is your eccentricity two or three times a day i have my soul in my belly and then i speak out of my belly and crow like a cock i can't stop myself i really can't what were you before the misfortune i hadn't got to be anything it happened to me early in the cost footnote boarding with the wife's parents End of footnote. that is why i have only one child health and strength to it have you any money i have a few golden dowry a lot of it went in remedies on good jews the rest i gave her what do you live on on trouble the boys throw stones at me i daren't go about in the market-place else i might have earned something near a stall at one time people were sorry for me and gave me things now times are bad i have to go begging i beg before dinner while the children are still in cheddar and is little enough i get by it the town is small there are two mad people in it beside me and now they say that yesterday the lakshish footnote macaroni cellar end of footnote threw a saucepan at her servant's head the servant is sure to go mad quite sure only i don't know yet if she will crow as i do or trumpet into her fist like the rabbi's schlamzi or be silent like hannah the tikarin End of section 38section thirty nine of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america stories and pictures by i l peretz translated by helena frank section thirty nine travel pictures misery i shall not call the little town by its name but if i come across another such i too shall begin to crow like the madman he was an excellent shoemaker who supported wife and children rarely less than four or five respectably he won a large sum of money in a lottery took to drink drank it all up left his wife and children to shift for themselves disappeared and must have died since somewhere or other beneath a hedge but that is not specifically jewish take another one of us his partner in the lottery ticket he was a teacher won some money hired a mill together with the reb 
the mill failed now he is beetle in a chasidique meeting-house gets nothing for it but he sells the bitter drop the wife is a buyer in takes round eggs and butter to the houses she doesn't earn much because she is lame one son is away the second works somewhere at a carpenter's one is at home scrofulous the widow beale bash surname unknown lives with a daughter-in-law a soldier's wife the husband disappeared in the turkish war the daughter-in-law plucks feathers she is a tickerine and watches beside women in childbed or else by the sick in summer so long as the nobleman allowed it she gathered berries in the forest a sickly woman she does a little bit of begging besides Zinewell Graf has only lately become a skinner last year he was a great fisher rented a river which the nobleman wished to let to a christian he paid a lot of session money caught only forbidden fish the whole summer and is now in dire poverty schmerk bensis formerly a danzig trader it is twenty years since he came home empty-handed since then he trades in currant wine for kedush the wife is a sempstress has suffered a year or two with her eyes they haven't no children but competition in the current wine trade is very keen and they struggle melock barrels a fine young man only lately boarding with his father-in-law he was in business together with a cattle dealer and lost his money meantime the father-in-law died in poverty it is uncertain what he will do there are three little children not more i was also asked to put down a man they have forgotten the name a man with a wife and children nobody remembers how many but a lot who may arrive at any moment the nobleman has refused to renew his lease no one can tell what he will take to but you may as well put him down end of section thirty nine section number forty of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda Marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l Peretz, translated by helena frank section forty travel pictures the lamed wolfnick we the story is told me by a teacher of small children once had a real lamed wolfnick he said so himself i ask well he would have been a fine lamed wolfnick if he had he denied it stone and bone if he were questioned about it he lost his temper and fired up but of course people got wind of it they knew well enough yes kith and kin the whole town knew it as if there could be any doubt people talked it was clear as daylight in the beginning there were some who wouldn't believe they came to a bad end for instance yankif yosef weinshanker a man of eighty and much respected i can't quite explain but he sort of turned up his nose at him did he say anything heaven forbid but there like that turned up his nose as much as to say preserve us nothing worse well what do you think not more than five or six years after he was dead yankov yosef lay in his grave poor leah the milkwoman one was sorry for her it was muddy and she did not step off the stone causeway to make room for him would you believe it the milk went wrong at all her customers for a month on end and there was no begging off when approached on the subject he pretended to know nothing about it and scolded in to the bargain of course 
I wish to show off my knowledge, though a scholar declined the honor due to him. A scholar? Is a lamed wolfnick a scholar? And you think he knew even how to read Hebrew properly? He could manage to make seven mistakes in spelling Noah. Besides, Hebrew is nothing. Hebrew doesn't count for much with us. He could not even read through the weekly portion, and his reciting the Psalms made nevertheless an impression in the highest. The last Rebbe of blessed memory said that Weevil, that was his name, the lamed Wolfnick, cleft the seventh heaven, and you think his psalm singing was all? Wait till I tell you. Hannah, the tinkerin's goat, not of you be it said, fell sick, and she drove it to the genteel exorcist, who lives behind the village. The goat staggered, she was so ill. On the way, it was heaven's doing, the goat met the lamed wolfnick and as she staggered along she touched his cloak what do you think cured as i live hannah kept it to herself only what happened afterwards was this a disease broke out among the goats literally there was not a house in which there was not one dead then she told the lame wolfnick was enticed into the marketplace, and all the goats were driven at him. And they all got well? What a question! They even gave a double quantity of milk. The tinkerin got a groschen a goat. She became quite rich. And he? He? Nothing. Why, he denied everything and even got angry and scolded and such an one may not take money he is no good jew he must not be discovered how did he live at one time he was a shoemaker a lamed wolfnick has got to be a workman if only a water carrier only he must support himself with his hands he used to go to circumcisions in a pair of his own shoes, but in his old age he was no longer any good for a shoemaker. He could no longer so much as draw the thread, let alone put in a patch. His hands shook. He just took a message, carried a canful of water, sat up with the dead at night recited psalms was called up to the tocheco and in winter there was the stove to heat in the house of study he carried wood carry wood why where were the boys the wood was brought laid in the stove he gave the word and applied the light people say a stove is a lifeless thing and yet do you know the house of study stove knew him as a woman levi hadil knows her husband he applied a light and the stove burnt the wind might be as high as you please everywhere else it smoked but in the house of study it crackled and the stove a split one such an old thing as never was and let anyone else have a try by no means either it wouldn't burn or else it smoked through every crack and the heat went up the chimney and at night one nearly froze to death when he died they had to put in another stove because nobody could do anything with the old one he was a terrible loss so long as he lived there was parsona now heaven help us one may whistle for a dryer there was no need to call in a doctor and all through his psalms you ask such a question why 
it was as clear as day that he delivered from death and no one died in his day all alive nobody died do you suppose the death angel has no voice in the matter how many times do you suppose has the good jew himself a blessed memory wished a complete recovery and he satan opposed him with all his might well was it any good an angel is no trifle and the heavenly academy once in a while decides in the death angel's favor well then there was no doctor wanted not one could get on here now we have two doctors besides the exorcist he was taken too gephardt one doesn't say gephardt of anyone like that the other side is no trifle either end of section 40 recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section 41 of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l Peretz, translated by helena frank section 41 travel pictures the informer if tomashef had a lamed wolflink it had an informer too this also was told me by the primary school teacher neither is it long since he only i don't know how it should be expressed departed died was taken perhaps you think an ordinary informer in the usual sense of the word he saw a false weight an unequal balance and went and told heaven forbid not at all it was all blackmail all frightening people into paying him not to tell see there he goes he runs he drives he writes he sends and he sucked the marrow from the bones and he was badly used himself continued the teacher i remember when urchum first brought him here a fine young man only urchum promised dowry and board and hadn't enough for a meal for himself and urchum had been badly used too his brother getzel a rich miser as ever was he had the most to answer for it is a tale of two brothers one clever and good the other foolish and bad the good clever one poor and the bad fool a rich man of course the rich brother would do nothing for the poor one well so long as it was only a question of food yurchum said nothing but when his daughter grun had come to be an overgrown girl of nineteen or twenty yurchum made a commotion the town and the rabbi took the matter up and getzil handed over a written promise that he would give so and so much to be paid out a year after her marriage not any sooner the couple might change their minds yurchum would spend the money and there would be the whole thing over again he getzil wished to defer the payment until the end of three years but they succeeded in getting him to promise to pay it in one year when the time came getzil said not a penny anyhow according to their law the paper isn't worth a farthing and meanwhile it became impossible to settle it within the community 
the old rabbi had died the new rabbi wouldn't interfere he was afraid of the crown rabbi lest he send it up to the regular courts and there it ended getzel wouldn't give a kopeck yurchum disappeared either on the way to a good jew or else he went begging through the country and Vinshi remained with grun truly the ways of the most high are past finding out it seems ridiculous he was a lad and she was a girl but it was all upside down the woman an engine a cossack and the husband a misery a bag of bones and what do you think she took him in hand and made a man of him she was always setting him on getzel he was to prevent the congregation from taking out the scrolls until the matter was settled prevent getzel from being called up to the law it made as much impression as throwing a pea at a wall getzel cuffed him and after that the young fellow was ashamed to appear in the house of study once just before passover when all devices had failed grun again drove benshi to his uncle and drove him with a broom benshi went again and again the uncle turned him out i tell you it was a thing to happen my second wife to be had just been divorced from her first husband and she was grun's lodger and she saw benshi come home with her own eyes he was more dead than alive and shook as if he had the fever and my good woman was experienced in that sort of thing she had been the matron of the herdish before it was burnt down and she saw that something serious had happened it was just about the time when grun was to come home she sold rolls from the market and she would have knocked him down and my good wife advised him out of compassion to lie down and rest on the stove and he poor man was like a dummy tell him to do a thing and he did it he got up on the stove grun came home my good woman said nothing ben she lay and slept or pretended to sleep on the stove and perhaps he was not quite clear in his head because when getzel was turning him out of the house he cried out that he would tell where they had hidden getzel's son and if he had been clear in the head he would not have said a thing like that however that may be the words made a great impression on getzel's wife may my enemies know of their life what benshi knew of the whereabouts of jonah getzel's but there a woman a mother an only son so what do you think she had a grocery shop got a porter and a bag of passover flour and had it carried after her to goon she goes in such a pity my wife isn't here she was an eyewitness of it and when she tells the story it is enough to make you split with laughter she goes in leaves the porter outside the room good morning grun grun makes no reply and getzel's wife begins to get frightened where she asks is benshi the black year knows answers grun and turns to the fireplace where she goes on skimming the soup he must have gone to inform she thinks she calls in the porter the sack of meal is put down 
groom does not see or pretends she doesn't devil knows which getzel's wife begins to flush and tremble gunshi we are relatives one blood call him back why should he destroy himself and my soul with him then only groon turned around she was no fool and soon took in the situation she got a few more roubles out of them and made believe to go after benshi it was soon rumored in the town that benshi was an informer and groon was glad of it she kept benshi on the stove and bullied and drew blood at every householder's where there was anything wrong at any rate she was the informer first she and then he himself in his misery he took to drink hung about at night in the public houses threatened to inform all on his own account he never gave groon a penny and spent all he had in dissipation it was sad a man like that to end so what happened he burnt up his inside with drink first he went mad and ran about in the streets or lay out somewhere for weeks under a hedge but home to groon not for any money even when he was quite a wreck ten men couldn't get him back into his house he fought and bit he had to be brought into the house of study the headdish was no longer in existence and there he died they tried to save him called in a specialist recited psalms the lamed wolfnick too certainly well a man with no inside what could you expect end of section forty one recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington Section 42 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 42 the outcast may had been cold and wet from beginning to end people began to feel as if summer would never come as if it would go on freezing and raining forever at last the day before pentecost the sun shone out torah is light said my father with proud satisfaction and began to look for the tikkun footnote order of service end of footnote for the night of pentecost in honor of the holy feast day exclaimed my mother joyfully and went back with fresh courage to her cake making i'm going to bake gelachella footnote bread made with saffron end of footnote she called to us soon the house was filled with the smell of freshly kneaded dough saffron cinnamon and cloves sugared cheese and melted butter my younger sister hannah took no part in what was going forward she sat by the window over a book but she read nothing and her eyes stared anxiously out into the street our mother called on her several times for help but hannah did not even answer the pale face wears a scornful smile the delicate lips open she is about to speak but she remains silent and fastens her eyes upon her book lazy thing grumbles our mother always poring over books working day or holiday it's all the same to her our father who rarely interferes in household matters having found the book and dusted it lies down to sleep before bathing to prepare for being up at night our mother stops complaining lest she should wake him 
she calls me quietly to her gives me a few pennies and tells me to go downstairs and buy a bit of green and some colored paper with which to festoon the windows heaven knows i am unwilling enough to leave the room wherein stands a bowl of sweet cream another of sugared cheese and where packets of currants and raisins lie all about at the same time going to buy to bargain over and to pay for greenery and paper was still more seductive and away i run and it turned out to be such a dreadful pentecost hannah my sister ran away we had gone to prayers and my mother had lain down to rest before blessing the lights it was then they gave a signal my mother remembered afterwards hearing a terrible whistle in her sleep and she left us and went over to our enemies and the time she chose us pentecost the season of the giving of our law it was then she left us everything passes away joy and sorrow good and evil and still we go forward on our way to the land where all things are forgotten or remembered anew everything we have lived through lies beneath our feet like stones in a beaten track like gravestones under which we have buried our friends good and bad but i cannot forget hannah the life she sought so eagerly spurned her from it the vision of happiness faded into thin air the flowers turned to sharp thorns in her grasp there was no return possible in her way stood the law and two graves her father's grave and her mother's where is she once every year on the eve of pentecost she shows herself to me again she appears in the street she stands outside at the window as if she were afraid as if she had not the power to enter a jewish home she gazes with staring eyes into the room and sees me there alone she looks at me with dismay supplication and anger i understand her where are they she asks in dismay have pity on me she says imploring and then in anger she lays the whole blame of the disaster on us what could i know of your bitter feud with them you knew you learned all about it in school my books told me nothing not a word living in the same house with you i led a separate life my story-books were like mirrors filled with the bright reflection of other women's lives and as i read my own appeared there in all dreariness i have betrayed something i have been false to what i only exchanged saffron cakes for cakes of another sort the tales in mother's books of legends for others far more vivid and entrancing a bit of green in the window for the free fresh green of the woods and fields litanies for romances the narrow stifling routine of my daily life for sunshine and flowers for gladness and love i never betrayed you i never knew you i knew nothing of your sorrow and you never spoke to me of yourselves why did you not tell me of your love of the love which is your very being why did you not tell me of your beauty of the terrible blood-stained beauty of israel the beautiful the precious the exalted in our religion you hid it in yourselves you men you kept it from me you kept it from us of me of us with our flesh and blood with the strength of our youth struggling and crying out for life of us you asked only butter cake and gel chala you cast us out he who is high above all peoples who can see clearly through their tangled web of prejudice and hatred he shall judge her end of section forty two Section 43 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Bellevue, Washington. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank section forty three a chat it is warm real holiday weather and reb shanna a tall thin jew one of the last old kotzers and reb zurak one of the few remaining old belzers are taking a stroll outside the town 
as young men they had been enemies hating each other heart and soul reb shalnek led the kultzers against the beltzers and reb zernak the beltzers against the kultzers but now that they are old and kultzers are not what they were and beltzers have lost their go they have separated themselves from their former associates and left the meeting rooms where less pious but younger and stronger men have taken the lead they made peace in the synagogue in winter time beside the stove and now on this intermediate day of passover on the first fine afternoon they have come out together for a walk the sun shines in a wide blue sky the little grasses are springing up through the mold and one can distinctly see the angel who stands beside each blade and cries grow grow little birds fly about in flocks looking for last year's nests and rob shadna says to rub zarak a coatsker you see i mean a real coatsker the present ones don't count never thought much of the hegda but only of the dumplings smiles reb zarak never mind about the dumplings answers reb shakna gravely and don't laugh you know the meaning of thou shall not deliver up a slave to his master for me says the beltzer with humble pride it is enough to know the hidden meaning of the prayers rob shakna pretends not to have heard and continues the little interpretation is simple enough if a slave or a servant or a serf run away one may not according to the law catch him bind him and give him up to his master it is evident if a man runs away his very life was endangered but the hidden meaning is also quite clear the body here below is a slave it is the servant of the soul the body is sinful it sees a piece of pork an idol a woman what not and is ready to jump out of its skin but when the soul says thou shall not it must desist on the other hand suppose the soul desires to perform a religious act the body must be up and doing however tired and harassed the hands must work the feet must run the lips move and why the soul the lord commands and therefore it is written thou shalt not deliver up the body may not be handed over unconditionally to the soul the fiery soul would speedily burn it to ashes had the creator wished for souls without bodies he would not have made the world the body also has its rights he who fasts much is a sinner the body must eat he who would ride must feed his horse comes a feast a holiday be merry too take a sip of brandy rejoice body likewise and the soul rejoices and the body rejoices the soul in the benediction and the body in the glass passover the season of our deliverance here body catch a dumpling and it is inspirited and cheered and rejoices to fulfill the commandment farewell dumpling brother do not laugh rob zarak opines that the matter is a deep one and worth consideration but he himself does not eat sharia do you enjoy passover cakes dry for dessert smiles rob zarak 
and where are my teeth to eat them with how then do you observe the precept and thou shalt rejoice in thy feasts as regards the body all sorts of ways if it likes currant wine well and good i myself revel in the haggadah i sit and repeat and count the plagues and count and double them and multiply materialism materialism after all the misery and the hard labor after the long exile of the divine presence in my opinion there ought to be a custom introduced of repeating the plague seven times and seven times pour out thy wrath but the great thing is the plagues i delight in them i wish i could open the door at the plagues let them hear why should i be afraid do you suppose they understand hebrew rob shakna is silent for a while and then he relates the following listen this is what happened one day with us i assure you i won't exaggerate in perhaps the tenth house from the rebbe's of blessed memory there lived a soshet who was may i be forgiven for saying so he is no more of this world a mad butcher a butcher among butchers one in a thousand a neck like a bull's eyebrows like bristles hands like logs and a voice a voice when he spoke it sounded like distant thunder or musketry he must have been at one time or another a belzer well well growls reb zurak well and continues reb shakna coolly he used to pray with the most extravagant gestures with shouts and whispers his they shall remember reminded one of sprinkling fire with water let that pass you can fancy the uproar when a fellow like this sat down to the hagda in the reb's chamber we could hear every word he read of course like a butcher and the laugh went round the rebbe of blessed memory scarcely moved his lips and yet everyone could see that he was smiling later however when the butcher began to count the plagues so that they shot from his mouth like bullets and brought his fist down on the table so that the glasses rang again the rebbe of blessed memory became melancholy melancholy on a feast day passover what do you mean well we asked him the reason why and what did he answer god himself was his reply became melancholy on the occasion of the exodus where had he found that it's a midrash when the children of israel had crossed the red sea and the water had covered up and drowned pharaoh and all his host then the angels began to sing songs serapum and opium flew into all the seven heavens with hymns and glad tidings all the stars and planets danced and sang and the celestial bodies you can guess what rejoicings but the creator put an end to them a voice issued from the throne my children are being drowned in the sea and you rejoice and sing because god created even pharaoh and all his host even the devil himself and it is written his tender mercies are over all his works certainly sighs reb zurak he says nothing more for a while and then asks and if it is a midrash 
what has he added to it to deserve praise reb shakna stands still and says gravely first belts are fool no one has the duty to be original there is no chronological order in the law the new is old the old is new secondly he showed us why we recite the hagda even the plagues in the hagda to a mournful sinny tune a tune that is steeped in grief thirdly he translated the precept al tishmak yisrael el gil ko amim materialist rejoice not in a coarse way you are no bore revenge is not for jews end of section forty three recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section forty four of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington stories and pictures by i l Peretz, translated by helena frank section forty four the pike in honor of the feast day live fish have been bought two large pike are lying in a great green glass bowl filled with water and a little further off in one of blackened earthenware two or three small carp these are no sea folk but they come out of a fairly wide river and they are straightened for room in the bowls the poor little carp in the one of black glaze have been aware of its confines for some time past they have lain for a good hour by the clock wondering what sort of a prison this may be and there is plenty of leisure for thinking it may be long before the cook comes home from market with good things for the feast day long enough for even a carp to have an idea but the pike in the glass bowl have not taken in the situation yet time after time they swim out strongly and bang their heads against the hard glass pike have iron heads but dull wits the two captive heroes have received each a hundred knocks from every part of the bowl but they have not yet realized that all is closed to them they feel the walls but the weak pike eyes do not see them the glass is green it is just like river water and yet there is no getting out it is witchcraft says one pike to the other the other agrees with him tomorrow there is an auction the other bidders have bewitched us some crayfish or frog has done this it is only a short time since the net drew them out of the water when they got into the air they had fainted to recover consciousness inside a barrel of which the lid had been hammered down how the days are drawing in they had observed both at once there was very little room in the barrel scarcely sufficient to turn in and hardly water enough for any one to breathe what with having fainted before and now this difficulty in breathing they had fallen into a doze and had dreamt all sorts of things of the fair and even of the opera and the ballet but the dream angel never showed them any kind of barrel they heard nothing not even the opening of the barrel and the hubbub of the market neither perceived they the trembling of the scales in which they oscillated whilst the cook haggled over them with the fish wife 
or remarked the click-clack of the pointer that spoke their doom they slept still more soundly in the cook's basket starting into life again only in the bowl beneath the rush of cold water and now after doing unwilling penance for an hour against the glass they have only just hit upon witchcraft what are we to do says one to the other the carp know themselves to be in prison they too have had experience of a long night and awoke in a bowl some one say they had palmed off counterfeit banknotes on us it will be proved they are sure if only one could get a hold of someone who will take the matter up properly they give a little leap into the air catch sight of the pike and fall back more dead than alive they are going to eat us they say trembling not until they realize that the pike are likewise in prison do they feel somewhat reassured they they certainly have been passing counterfeit notes too says one carp to the other yes and therein lies our salvation they will not keep silence and with god's help we shall all be set free together and they will see us and with god's help will eat us up and the carp nestle closer against the bowl they can just see a tub full of onions on the kitchen floor if we signed the contract we might receive a golden order observes one of the pike please god we shall be decorated yet answers the other it is a case of witchcraft but but what there is one thing well it sounds almost absurd but i wanted to tell you we ought to pray he stammers it is the best thing against sorcery to pray perhaps so whereupon the two pike discover that it is years since they prayed last they cannot remember a word a sheer begins one a sheer repeats the other and comes to a standstill oh i want to pray moans the first so do i chimes in the second for when all is said and done we are but fish a door opens in the wall a little way and two heads are seen in the aperture a tipsy-looking man's head and a woman's with curl papers ah exclaims the man's head joyously this is something like pike carp and all the other good things i should hope so and i have sent for meat besides my knowing little wife chuckles the man's head there there that will do and the heads disappear did you hear said a pike there are carp too they have the best of it how is that to begin with they have made no contracts they are free agents secondly they can leap if they would only give a good leap they would find themselves back in the river quite true and something good might come of it for us wait a bit let's try carp the carp have suddenly swum to the surface of the water and are poking their noses over the edge of the bowl the pike face to face with the carp bad luck brothers he exclaimed bad answered the carp bitter bitter very little water oh very little and it smells ugh not fit to live in not fit we must get home back to the river we must we have forgotten what it was like in the river forgotten a sin a mortal sin let us beat our head against a wall and do penance 
The carp flattened their bellies against the bowl. The pike wrung their head against the glass till it rings again. One should leap away home, continues the pike. One should leap. Well, leap. The pike commands, and the carp are out of the bowl and on the floor, lying there more dead than alive. I never knew, says the second pipe, that you were such an orator. Your lips dropped honey. The carp, meanwhile, are moaning. Hurry up, orders the pike. The carp give another little spring. Oh, they moan. We do not see any river, and our bones are breaking, and we cannot breathe. On with you. Make an effort. It is not much farther. Give a jump. But the carp are past hearing. The carp lie dying on the floor, and the pike are having a dispute. Both opine that any proper leap would carry one into the river. But one says that other fish are wanted, not stupid carp, who can only leap in the water, who cannot exist for an hour without food, and that what are wanted are electric fish. And the other says, no carp, only lots and lots of carp. If one hundred thousand carp were to leap, one would certainly fall into the river and if one fell in why then ha ha end of section 44 recording by linda marie nielsen bellevue washington section 45 of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 45. The Fast. A winter's night, Sarah sits by the oil lamp, darning an old sock. She works slowly for her fingers are half frozen her lips are blue and brown with cold every now and then she lays down her work and runs up and down the room to warm her icy feet in a bed on a bare straw mattress sleep four children two little heads at each end covered up with some old clothes now one child and now another gives a start a head is raised and there is a plaintive chirp hungry patience dears patience says sarah soothingly father will be here presently and bring you some supper i will be sure to wake you and something hot asked the children whimpering we have had nothing hot to-day yet and something hot too but she does not believe what she is saying she glances round the room perhaps after all there is something left that she can pawn nothing four bare damp walls split stove everything clammy and cold Two or three broken dishes on the chimney piece. On the stove, an old battered chanica lamp. Overhead, in the beam, a nail. Sole relic of a lamp that hung from the ceiling. Two empty beds without pillows and nothing, nothing else. The children are sometime getting to sleep. Sarah's heart aches as she looks at them. Suddenly she turns her eyes, red with crying, to the door. She has heard footsteps, heavy footsteps on the stairs leading down into the basement. A clatter of cans against the wall, now to the right, now to the left. A gleam of hope illumines her sunken features. She rubs one foot against the other two or three times, rises stiffly, and goes to the door. She opens it, and in comes a pale, stoop-shouldered Jew with two empty cans. Well, she whispers. He puts away the cans, takes off his yoke, and answers, lower still, nothing, nothing at all. Nobody paid me. Tomorrow, they said. Everyone always says tomorrow. The day after tomorrow. On the first day of the month. The children have hardly had a bite all day, articulates Sarah. Anyway, they're asleep. That is something. Oh, my poor children. She can control herself no longer and begins to cry quietly. What are you crying for? asked the man. 
oh mendel the children are so hungry she is making desperate efforts to gulp down her tears and what is to become of us she moans things only get worse and worse worse no sarah it is a sin to speak so we are better off than we were this time last year i had no food to give you and no shelter the children were all day rolling in the gutter and they slept in the dirty courts now at least they sleep on straw they have a roof over their head sarah's sobs grow louder she has been reminded of the child that was taken from her out there in the streets it caught cold grew hoarse and died and died as it might have died in the forest without help of any kind no tearing open the ark footnote when the weeping female relatives of the sick force their way through the male congregation to the ark throw it open and bedew the scrolls with their tears End of footnote. no measuring of graves nothing said over it to exercise the evil eye and it went out like a candle he tries to comfort her don't cry sarah don't cry so do not sin against god o oh, mendel if only he would help us sarah for your own sake don't take things so to heart see what a figure you have made of yourself do you know it is ten years to-day since we were married well well who would think you were the beauty of the town and you mendel do you remember you were called mendel the strong and now you are bent double you are ill and you don't tell me oh my god my god the cry escapes her the children are startled out of their sleep and begin to wail anew bread hungry who ever heard of such a thing who's going to think of eating today is mendel's sudden exclamation the children sit up in alarm this is a fast day continues mendel with a stern face several minutes elapse before the children take in what has been said to them what sort of fast is it they inquire tearfully and mendel with downcast eyes tell them that in the morning during the reading of the law the scroll fell from the desk whereupon he continues a fast was proclaimed in which even suckling children are to take part the children are silent and he goes on to say a fast like that on the day of atonement beginning overnight the four children tumble out of bed barefooted in their little ragged shirts they begin to caper around the room shouting we are going to fast to fast to fast mendel screens the light with his shoulders so that they shall not see their mother's tears there that will do children that will do fast days were not meant for dancing when the rejoicing of the law comes then we will dance please god the children get back onto bed their hunger is forgotten one of them a little girl starts singing our father our king etc and all on the high mountain etc mendel shivers from head to foot one does not sing either he says in a choked voice the children are silent and go off to sleep tired out with singing and dancing only the eldest opens his eyes once more and inquires of his father tot when shall i be bar mitzwai but no confirmed end of footnote not yet not for a long time in another four years you must grow and get strong then you will buy me a pair of phylacteries of course and a little bag to hold them why certainly and a little tiny prayer book gilt edges with god's help you must pray to god chamley then i shall keep all the fasts yes yes chamley all the fasts adding below his breath lord of the world only not any like this one not like today's end of section forty five section forty six of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org stories and pictures by i l peretz translated by helena frank section forty six the woman mistress hannah a packet of letters first letter one two letters which hannah received from her brother menaka mendel and one letter from her sister-in-law eva guttel together three letters first letter life and peace to my worthy sister mistress hannah i have received your letter and i can tell you i wept tears enough over it 
and lay sighing and groaning one whole night long. But what what was the good, seeing God in heaven is witness that I can do nothing to help you? And as to what you write about the inheritance, I must tell you, dear sister, there is no sense in it. According to the Jewish law, you have no claim upon any part. Ask your husband, he is learned, he will tell you the same thing. But you need not wait for him to tell you. A clever woman like you can open the German Pentateuch and see for herself that Zelophe's daughters only inherited because there were no sons. As soon as there are sons, the daughters inherit nothing, and our father left no deed directing you were to inherit half as much as his male descendants. And all you say about our father, peace be upon him, not having given you the whole of your dowry, has nothing in it. Because, if you come to think, who does get the whole? You know, I did not, and yet I have no claim on any one. Besides, common sense will tell you that if our father, peace be upon him, did not keep to his engagement, neither did the other side. And so the matter rested. The two parties forgave each other, as is the custom among us Jews. I would not trust my own judgment, but talked the matter over with our rabbi and his assistants, and we were all agreed that so it should be. Further, as regards your contention that you boarded at home only half a year instead of a whole one, I know nothing about it. Our father, peace be upon him, never told me, and you know quite well that just then I was living separated from my family and spent the whole time at the Rebbe's, long life to him, and Ava Guttel tells me it was this way. There was a bit of a dispute between you over our mother's seat in the women's shul, peace be upon her, and you tore each other's hair and our mother, peace be upon her, was greatly distressed. And one Sabbath evening you picked up your bundle and your husband and were off to his native town. If so, what do we owe you? Whom do you mean in your letter? Who asked you to run away? When people want to board, they should board. But heaven forbid that I should distress you with reproaches. I only wish to show you how unjust you are. Of course, right or wrong, one has to act according to law, especially in the case of a sister. Only, what is the good of wishing? If one can't, one can't. You must know, dear sister, that before our father of blessed memory departed, he made a will, by which he left the large Talmud to the large house of study, and the small edition to the small house of study. The Mishnahs and the Bible were to be sent to the meeting room where he used to recite the prayers. The funeral cost two hundred gulden, and I distributed alms to the amount of fifty gulden. What am I saying? A great deal more than fifty. I divided our father's clothes among the poor, except the silk cloak which I am keeping, agreeable to the will for my little Moshe, for that in a propitious hour he may walk in it to the marriage canopy, and may it be soon, even in our days, amen. What remains? Nothing remains but the house. Well, it isn't worth insuring. Even the roof, not of you be it said, has the falling sickness. It hangs by a hair. The town justice says the old firewall must be taken down, and altogether it's in a dangerous state. You fancy, dear sister, that I am doing well for myself. When our father died and there was an end of board, I let the three little rooms to the left to Grunem, the dealer, called Grunem Zop. You must have known him and his wife Slate. I worry along with the money and can only just pay the taxes and other duties that grow from day to day. Meantime, I'd try dodges, give the collector a sip of brandy, come later, come tomorrow, and so on. But the rope round my neck tightens every day, and what the end of it will be, heaven only knows. I live in the three rooms to the right, that are one with the inn and the public room. Times are very bad. The villages round about have taken the pledge not to drink brandy. Besides this, the landowner has opened a cheap eating shops and tea houses for the peasants. What more need I say? It's despair. One may stare one's eyes out before one sees a peasant come. You say in your letter that every one from here tells you I am flourishing. The fact is, people see the possessions of others with bigger eyes. One has to struggle for every drayer, and meanwhile there is Belshazzar's wedding coming, and I am getting old and gray with it all. The expenses are endless. They will lend you nothing. There is still a silk overrobe wanting for the wedding outfit, 
and as soon as the wedding is over, my Ava Guttel must consult a doctor. If Shmuel, the Rofa, advises her to go, you can imagine the condition she must be in. I consulted the Rebbe, long life to him, and he also advised her going to Warsaw. Her cough gets worse every day. You would think people were chopping wood in the room. And as to your trying to frighten me by saying that if I don't behave myself, you will write our relative in Lublin, and she will go to her lawyer and have me handed over to the Gentiles, you know, my dear sister, that I am not the least afraid. First, because a pious woman like you, my sister, knows very well what a Jewish court is, and Lebdeville, what a Gentile court is. You wouldn't do anything so stupid. No Jewish woman would do that. And even if you wanted to, you have a husband, and he would never allow such a shameful proceeding. He would never dare to show himself to his Rebbe or the Strubel again. Besides that, I advise you not to throw away money on lawyers. They are incredible people. You give and give, and the moment you stop giving, they don't know who you are. And I must remind you of the Tomashev story, which our father, on whom be peace, used to tell. You may have forgotten it, so I will tell it you over again. In Tomashev there died a householder, and his daughter, a divorced woman, fell upon the assessor. He was to give her a share in the inheritance according to their custom. As she stood talking with the assessor, a coal sprang out of the hearth in her room at home. The room took fire, and a child of hers, not of you or any Jew be it said again, was burned. And I advise you, Sister Hannah, to be sorry and do penance for what you have written. Trouble, as they say, steals the man's wits, but it might, heaven forbid, be brought against you, and you ought to impose something on yourself, if only a day's fasting. I, for my part, forgive you with my whole heart, and if, please God, you come to my daughter's wedding, everything will be made up, and we shall all be happy together. Only forbear, for heaven's sake, to begin again about going to the law. And I am vexed on account of your husband, who says nothing to me about his health. If he is angry with me, he commits a sin. He must know what is written about the sinfulness of anger, besides which there is a rumor current that he was not once at the Rebbe's during the solemn days, but prayed all the while in the house of study, and they also say that he intends to abandon study and take up something or other else. He says he intends to work with his hands. You can imagine the grief this is to me, because what shall become of the Torah, and who shall study if not a clever head like him? He must know that our father, on whom be peace, did not agree to the marriage on that condition, and especially nowadays when the nations of the world are taking to trade and business decreases daily. It is for the women to do business and for the men to devote themselves to the Torah, and then God may have mercy on us. It would be better for him to get a diploma as a rabbi, or let him become a shokit or, or a teacher, anything, only not a traitor. If I were only sure that he wouldn't turn my child's heart away from my Rebbe, I would send him my Moshele for teaching and board. See to it that your husband gives up those silly notions and do you buy a shop or a stall, and may the merits of the fathers on your side and on his be your help and stay. Further, I advise you to throw off the melancholia with which your letter is penetrated, so that it is heartbreaking to read. A human being without faith is worse than a beast. He goes about the world like an orphan without a father. We have a God in heaven, blessed be he, and he will not forsake us. When a person falls into melancholia, it is a sign that he has no faith and no trust. And this leads, heaven forbid, to worse things, the very names of which shall not pass my lips. Write me also, Sister Hannah, how peas are selling with you, our two great traders, you remember them? The lame Yochanan and the blind Yoa have raised the price that our noblemen cannot get any for seed. One might do a little business. It may be heaven's will that I should make a trifle toward wedding expenses. Of course, I don't mean you to do me a kindness for nothing. If anything comes of it, I will send you some money so that you and your husband may come to Belsash's wedding, and I will give a present for you, 
a wedding present from the bride's family. Ava Guttle sends you her very friendly greetings. She does not write herself because it is fair day. There are two produce dealers here of the Schmoes Gluttons, and they insist on having stuffed fish. The bride has gone to the tailors to be measured for a dress, and I am left alone to keep an eye on the Gentile cooks. Try now, dear sister, for heaven's sake, not to take things to heart and to have faith. He who feeds the worm in the earth and the bird in its nest will not forsake you. Greet your husband, from me your brother, Menachem Mendel. End of chapter 46「Section 47 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Dearman, Bartlett, Illinois. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 47. The Woman Mistress Hannah. A packet of letters. Second letter. Life and peace to my sister, Mistress Hannah. I have received your second letter. It was soaked with tears and full of insults directed against me, my wife, Eva Gietel, and even the bride, Baal Sasha. And it has upset me very much. For why? You say, Sister Hannah, that I am a bandit that I met you, heaven forbid, in a wood, and heaven forbid, murdered you, that it was I and my wife, Eva Gietel, who drove you from the house, that Baal Sasha, in your opinion, is a hussy, because she is ordering silk dresses? What am I to say? I must listen in silence, knowing the trouble you are in, that it is not you that speak, but your heavy heart. But it is not as you think. I am no murderer, thank heaven. And were any one to come from the street and declare that the cloak I am wearing is his, and that he is going to law about it, I should go with him to the rabbis without a word. And if, God willing, you come to the wedding, we will go together and have it out. And see here, about the board you did not eat, you confess in your letter that it came about through a quarrel between you and my wife. It is not my affair who began it. And all I see is that your husband was a great booby, that he followed after his wife. They say that you ran away in the evening following Sabbath and made yourselves a laughing stock. Our father was greatly distressed, and it shortened his days. He said so plainly. Neighbors heard it. And you put it all on Eva Giedel? It's a calumny. What is done is done. Our father lies in his grave. There can be no more question of board or anything. And you know very well that Baal Sasha, the bride, is no hussy. She, poor thing, is quite innocent in the matter. Her future father-in-law, the Tokif, forced me to order the silk dresses. Once even she cried and said it would ruin us, but what am I to do? When the contract says in dresses of silk and satin, and he will hear of no alteration, it's take it or leave it. And there would be no choice but to see my daughter, an old maid. And you know the dowry will not be given entirely in cash. I have promised six and given 300 rubles. I have mortgaged the house for 200 rubles. And you know the house stands in our father's name. So that I had to pay extra. And now I am so short of money that may God have mercy on me. But what is the use of telling that to a woman? Our sages were right when they said... Women are feather-brained. And there is the proverb, long hair, in girls, of course, and short wits. I shall write separately to your husband. He is a man learned in the law, and he will know that one human being should not lean upon another. Because, as we are told, a human being can only just support himself. One must have faith. And I am convinced that God will not forsake you. He does not forsake the weakest fly. The Almighty alone can help you. You must pray to him, and I, for my part, when next I am, God willing, at his house, long life to him, I shall make a special offering in your behalf. That must help. As to the peas, the business is off. 
before there was time to turn, Gabriel, the tenant, had brought several cartloads from that part of the country. He has made a fortune. He is about to marry a son and actually given a dowry. It so pleased God that you should not be able to afford a stamp. Your answer was belated, and Gabriel is the winner. As to what you write about your child being poorly, you must consult the roof. Don't fancy it in danger. Keep up your spirits. I have done my part. I got up quite early, went to the great house of study, dropped a coin into the collecting box of Mayor Bailness, wrote on the east wall for complete recovery in big letters, and as soon as we have made a little money, I will send some candles to the shoal. I will also tell the Rebbe, and not explain that your husband is no follower of his, and you know that I am quite a son of the house. From me, thy brother, Monikin Mendil. My wife, Eva Gietel, sends you a very friendly greeting, the bride another. One of these days, God willing, you will receive an invitation to the wedding, and may it bring us all good luck. Monikin Mendil, the above. End of section 47. Recording by Linda Dearman. Section 48 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Trax, Bangalore, India. www.humanityhelps.me Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz Translated by Helena Frank Section 48 The Woman Mistress Hana A Packet of Letters 1 Third Letter To my beloved sister-in-law and worthy relative, the excellent woman Mistress Hana, I beg to inform you that from this time on, I shall receive your letters and not my tender-hearted husband, and I, I will burn them. Second, my dear sister-in-law, between ourselves, it was great forwardness on your part to fall upon us just before the wedding, turning our days into nights, and now you wish to blight our married life with discord. You must fancy that you are still boarding with my father-in-law, a spoiled only daughter that has never learned manners, and just because you can't have the moon to play with, you are ready to scratch people's eyes out, turn the world upside down, and your cries pierce the heavens. I can hear you now, tapping with your feet, and the bang of your fist on the table, while your ninny of a husband goes into the corner, wags his sheep's head, and his earlocks shake like lulavim. And father-in-law, may he forgive me, lets the spoiled child have her way. Dear sister-in-law, Hannah, it is time to awaken from sleep to forget the empty dreams and to realize the kind of world one is in. My father-in-law of blessed memory has long lain in his grave. There is an end to boarding. You can only be spoiled by your husband now, and I show you twice five fingers. And I have told the postman to deliver your letters to me, not to my husband, my innocent lamb. You know, dear sister-in-law, that people are scandalized at the way you go on. Whoever hears of it thinks you are possessed. Cyril the Negida told me plainly she thought you deserved to be crimped like a fish and I cannot make out what it is you want of me. It was not I, Eva Gutel, 
who wrote the Torah. It was not I, Eva Gittel, who descended on Sinai with thunder and lightning to deprive you of a share in the inheritance. And if my father-in-law was as great an idler as your husband is a ninny, and no document made special provision for you, am I to blame? It is not for me to advise the Almighty. The keys of the gate of mercy are not in my pocket. There is a somebody whom to implore. Have you no prayer book, no supplications? Pray, beg for mercy, and if your child is really ill, is there no ark to tear open? Are there no graves to measure, no pious offerings to make? But the only idea you have is Eva Gittel. Eva Gittel, and once more, Eva Gittel. If you haven't, Parnose, whose fault? Eva Gittel's, and you pour out upon her the bitterness of your heart. If the child is ill, whose fault? Of course, Eva Gittel's, and you scream my head off. God in heaven knows the truth. I am a sick woman. I struggle for breath. And if I am vexed, I am at death's door. And when the cuff seizes me, I think it's all over, that I am done for. I live, as they say, with one foot in the house and one in the grave. And if the doctors order me abroad to drink the waters, I shall be left, heaven forbid, without so much as a chemise. And who is to look after the house and the housekeeping and the sick children was? I think you know that the whole house depends on me, that Menahem Mendel has only to move to cause a disaster. Of all putty fingers, a man that's no use to heaven or earth can't put a hand into cold water. Nothing. And now, as if I hadn't troubles enough, the doctor must needs come and say my liver is enlarged, the danger great, and in fact that may heaven have mercy on me and you, insisting that I am a rich woman who can help you. Dear sister-in-law, I tell you, you have the heart of a Tartar, not that of a Jewish daughter. You are without compassion. It is time you left off writing those affectionate letters of yours and for heaven's sake come to the wedding which please god will be soon when i don't exactly know and i will not be responsible for the day menahem mendel shall go to the holy man and consult with him so that it take place in a propitious hour I will be sure to tell you, and you are not to bring presents. And if your husband, as I hope, comes with you, you will be among the privileged guests, and I will seat you at the top of the table. And the bride also begs very much that you will come to her wedding. Only you must behave well, remember where you are, and not put us to shame and confusion. Greet your husband and wish the child a complete recovery. From me, your sister-in-law, Eva Gittel. End of section 48. Recording by Tracks, Bangalore, India. www.
www.humanityhelps.me Section 49 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 49. The Woman Mistress Hannah. A Packet of Letters. 2. First Letter. Four letters which Hannah received from her husband, Shmuel Moshe. To my beloved wife, Mistress Hannah, when my letter is given into your hands, I, Shmuel Moshe, shall be already far away, and I beg you with my whole heart to forgive me for that same. I left you not of my own good will. I couldn't bear it any longer. I saw plainly that there was no help for it, that the trouble was not to be borne. We have eaten up the dowry. The inheritance has been swallowed by your bandit of a brother. He used the time when the letters were passing between you to have the house entered in the name of his son-in-law's father. I couldn't set up any kind of business. I hadn't the wherewithal. There was nothing left for me but to hang myself, which heaven forbid like Leeser the tailor, or to run away to America. I chose America, so as at least not to lose the other world as well, and I shall not be idle there. With God's help, and with the sweat of my brow, and with my ten fingers, I will earn my bread. And perhaps God will have mercy, and send a blessing into my ten fingers, and perhaps he will also bless your trade in onions, and bring us together again, either me to you, or you to me. Amen. Thus may it seem a good in his sight. And I beg of you, dear good Hannah, not to take it to heart, not to cry so much. You know... I only go away for the sake of Parnosha, a bit of bread. You are my wife, Hannah, and I am your husband, Shul Moshe, and we are both bound to the child, life and health to it. If there had only been a piece of dry bread, I wouldn't have done it. Perhaps he whose name is blessed may meantime have compassion, and that when your brother the bandit hears that I, heaven forbid, have left you a grass widow, he will be touched. His stony heart will soften, and he will perhaps send you a few roubles. My precious Hannah, what am I to say to you? I must tell you that the idea of going away and leaving you with the child came into my head many and many a time. I saw long ago that I had no other choice. I thought it over day and night, at prayer and at study. I only waited till the child should be well, and when it got better, I hadn't the heart to tell you I wanted to go away, whither my eyes should take me. I was afraid you would say you wouldn't allow it, and that I should not be able to act against your will. So I kept everything to myself, ate my heart out in silence. But the day before yesterday, when you brought home a pound of bread and divided it between me and the child, and said you had eaten at our neighbor's, and I saw in your face, which turned all colors, because you cannot tell a lie, that you were fooling me, that you hadn't had a bite. Then I felt how I was sinning against you. Eating the bread, I felt as if it were your flesh, and afterward drinking a glass of tea, as if it were your blood. My eyes opened, and I saw, for the first time, what a sinner in Israel I was. And yet I was afraid to speak out. I ran away without your knowing. I pawned my outer cloak and prayer scarf to Yeshel, the money-lender, but don't, for the love of heaven, let anyone know, and paid for my journey. And if I should be in need, Jews are charitable and will not let me fall dead in the street, and I have made a vow that later on, when his name shall have had mercy, and I have earned something to give it in charity, not only what I got, but more, too, if God so please. You must understand, my precious Hannah, how hard and bitter it is for me to go away. When our dear only child was born, it never occurred to me that I should have to leave it fatherless, even for a time. The night I left, I must have stood over your bed an hour by the clock. You were asleep, and I saw in the moonlight for the first time what you, poor thing, have come to look like, and that the child was as yellow as wax. My heart choked me for terror and pity. I nearly burst out crying. 
and I left the room half dead. I knocked at the baker's and bought a loaf, stole back into the house and left it with you, and stood and looked at you a little while longer, and it was all I could do to drag myself away. What more am I to tell you? A man can go through the suffering of a hundred years in one minute. Hannah Crone, footnote, Hannah my crown, end footnote. I know that I am a bandit, a murderer, not to have got you a divorce, or at all events a conditional divorce, but God in heaven is my witness. I hadn't the heart. I felt that if I left you a divorce, I should die of grief on the way. We are a true and faithful couple. God himself was present at our union, and I am bound to you with my whole heart. We are one soul in two bodies, and I do not know how I shall live without you and without the child. May it be well even for a minute. And should anyone say I have left you a grass widow, don't believe it, for I, Shmuel Moshe, am your husband, and I have only done what I had to do. What will misery not drive a man to? Hannah Lee Crone, if I could lay my heart open before you, you would see what is going on there, and I should feel a little happier. As it is, dear soul, I am very wretched. The tears are pouring from my eyes so that I cannot see what I am writing, and my heart aches and my brain goes round like a mill wheel and my teeth chatter, and the letter carrier, the illiterate boar, stands over me and bangs on the table and cries, I must go, I must go. Lord of the world, have pity on me now and on my wife Hannah, health to her and on the child, so that I may have joy of it yet. From me, your dear husband, who writes in the inn on the way, Shmuel Moshe. End of section 49section 50 of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org stories and pictures by i l perrettes translated by helena frank section 50 the woman mistress hannah a packet of letters to second letter my precious and beloved wife what am i to say to you I see clearly that my idea of going away was heaven-sent, that God himself put the thought of America into my head. Everything he does is for the best. My dear Hannah, whenever I shut my eyes, I fancy myself at home again, and the dream comes from the other end of the world, for who would have thought that an idler like me, such a nincompoop as I am, such a born fool, should ride on a railway, cross the sea in a ship, and arrive safe in America. The finger of God. I will praise the Lord. It was God's disposing. His will alone enabled me to leave you and the child, and may we be counted worthy to rear it for the Torah, the marriage canopy, and all good works. Hannah Lee, Crone, I have seen great wonders on dry land, but nothing to what I saw on the sea. While I was at sea, I forgot everything I had seen on dry land, and now, among the wonders of America, I begin to forget about the sea. At first I was so miserable on board ship, there are no words for it. But all ended well, and I am sure it was for your sake and the child's. Hanalee, I am sure you remember Lieb the Reader. Footnote. Shazang, capital C-H-A-Z-A-N, the reader or reciter of prayers in the synagogue. End footnote. Who came to our town once a few years ago and recited the prayers in our shul during the solemn days. I remember that after the Day of Atonement you told me you had never heard such a davenin. Footnote meaning reciting of prescribed prayers. End footnote. In your life. I even recall the very words you used. Leave the reader roars like a lion and weeps like a child. Next morning there was something of a commotion in the town. People had forgotten Leave the reader, hadn't paid him properly. And he, poor man, went from house to house collecting money with a little girl, you remember, whose name was Janandil. She accompanied her father singing with her childish voice. When they came to our house, you were very sorry for her, took her into your lap, kissed her on the head, and gave her something... I forget what. And you cried for compassion over the motherless child. Perhaps you wonder at my remembering all this? You see, Hannah Lee Crone, I remember all the kind things you said and all your actions, 
for they were full of charm. You are continually before me. I fancied sometimes crossing the sea that you stood beside me, and that the child had hold of your apron, and I heard your voices, and they sounded in my ears with a sweetness beyond all description. And I have come across Lieb the Reader, by the way. Heaven forgive me, but Lieb the Reader has sunk very low. He paid no attention on board as to whether the food were kosher or not, and he drinks as if not the way with Jews. I never once saw him in prayer scarf and phylacteries the whole time, or saying grace after meat. He goes about all day without a hat, and not content with this, he leads his daughter into the same paths. The genendil of those days is now about seventeen. You should see her, a picture, and he made her sing and dance before the passengers on board ship, and she sings in different languages. The people listened and clapped with their hands with delight and cried out goodness knows what, and it was all so boisterous that really, at first, why deny it, I was very pleased to see them. It's always somebody from home, I thought. I wouldn't have to hang about so lonely and wretched. But afterward, I felt greatly distressed. I couldn't bear to watch his goings-on with his daughter. And now and again it cut me to the heart to hear a Jew, who used to stand at the reading desk, a messenger of Israel to the Almighty, talk such disgusting nonsense, and his voice is burned with brandy. And they must take me in hand and try to make me presentable. They made fun of me on board. It was always idler, fool. He tweaked my earlocks. She pulled the fringe off my little prayer scarf, and the whole ship took it up. And what ailed them at me? That I avoided forbidden food and preferred to fast rather than touch it. You know, I dislike quarreling, so I edged away hid in a corner, and wept my heart out in secret. But they discovered me and made a laughing stock of me, and I thought it would be my death. It is only here, in America, that I see it was all a godsend, that God, in his great goodness, had sent Lieb the reader before me into America, as he sent Joseph before his brothers into Egypt. Because what should I have done without them? A man without the language of the country, without a trade, not knowing at which door to knock. And Lieb the reader is quite at home here, talks English fluently, and he got me straight away into a cigar factory, and I am at work and earning something already. Meanwhile, we are in the same lodging, because how should I set about finding one for myself? And they behave quite differently to me now. Jenendil has given over quizzing me about my beard and earlocks, and keeps at a distance as beseems a Jewish daughter. She cooks for us, and that is very important, although I eat no meat, only eggs, and I drink tea without milk. Footnote, lest the meat and milk should not be ritually permitted. End of footnote, she washes for us too. There is a lesson to be learned from this, namely, that what the Lord does is for the best. And do you know why it has all turned out for the best? For your sake. On the boat already, when I began to feel I could bear it no longer, I plucked up my courage and went to Jenendil and told her I was your husband. I recalled to her memory the time after the Day of Atonement when they were in our house, how good you were to her, and how you took her on your knee, and so on. Her manner changed at once. She had compassion on me, and her eyes filled with tears. Then she ran to her father and talked it over with him, and we made peace. They immediately asked the captain to treat me better, and he agreed to do so. I was given bread as much as I could eat, and tea as much as I could drink. The crew stopped tormenting me, and I began to breathe again. You should have seen what a favorite Jenendel was on board, and no wonder. First, she is a great beauty, and for a beauty people will jump into the sea. Secondly, she is really good-natured, and people are simply charmed by her. And now, my precious wife, I will give you some good news. Lieb the reader tells me I shall earn at least ten dollars a week. I reckon to do so as follows. The half, five dollars, I will send to you, and keep five for myself. I will live on this and save up to buy a Talmud. The Mishnah books I brought with me. I have settled to read at least ten pages of the Gemara a week. I won't buy a prayer scarf, because so far I have prayed in Lieb the reader's, for Lieb the reader had one with him. To what end, I don't know, because as to praying, never a word. 
I persuade myself this is also heaven sent. He was made to bring a prayer scarf on my account. Perhaps he means to pray at the reading desk during the solemn days. Who knows? They are drawing near. Anything is possible in America. The world here is topsy-turvy, and the Lord knows best what is good for a man. Do you know what? I am not angry with your brother the bandit any longer. It's the same thing again, I tell you. That also was a godsend. It couldn't otherwise be possible that a man should treat his sister so. That was all brought about in order that I should run away to America and send for you to come to me. And when, God helping, I have made some money, I will assist your brother too. I tell you, he also is a pauper. I see now what we call a rich man is a beggar in America. I end my letter, and this time briefly, although I have heaps and heaps more to say, because I am afraid Glebe the reader and Jenandil may come in, and I don't want them to see what I have written to you. And I beg of you very much not to show my letters to a living soul. Why need a stranger know of our doings? And I hug and kiss the child, long life to it. Give it ten thousand loving kisses from me. Do you hear? From me, your husband, Shmuel Moshe. End of section 50. Section 51 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 51. The Woman, Mistress Hannah. A Packet of Letters to Third Letter. My Beloved Wife. I can remember when Yona the Shoemaker went to America and people began to talk about it for the first time, wondering what it was like there, how things were done. They asked whether people walked on their heads, and is it true that everything here is upside down? No sort of order, only a great shouting and noise, as in the butcher's meeting house at home. Imagine, for instance, Paltiel the wadding maker, and Yoshiel the canner coming and saying that our rabbi is not learned, and he is not experienced enough in the application of the law, or that they are not satisfied with the head of the community, that they want another rabbi, another communal head. Well, wouldn't one hold one side's laughing? And here in America, workmen, cigar cutters, for instance, like me, have a word to say in everything. They share in the elections, take part in the voting, and choose a president. And what do you think that is? A president is nothing more nor less than the supreme head of the whole country. And America, so I have heard, is ten times as large as the whole of Europe. You see what that means? Now imagine my surprise as I sit in my room one evening, thinking of home, and suddenly the door opens and there come in two workmen, ordinary workmen who stand with me at the same machine and are Ekins ne Israel. Footnote. Our brothers, the children of Israel. End of footnote. And they laid two names before me. I don't even recollect what they were and tell me, I also am a workman and must see to the election of a president who shall favor our class. And they told me that one president was all for the rich people and trod down on all those who lived by their ten fingers, while the second, the one they wanted to have elected, was a jewel. He stood for the working man like a flint and pursued the bloated upper classes with a fierce hatred and more such foolishness which I did not understand. Inwardly, I laughed at them. But for the sake of peace, it is not seemly to be rude to people. I did them the favor and nodded yes. All I wanted was to get rid of them, so as to sit down and write to you. But isn't it a madness? They say, if the president is elected according to their wish, I shall earn ten dollars a week, and if not, only nine or perhaps eight. And Lieb the reader says he understands politics, that there is sense in it all, and that if I remain here some time, I shall get to know something about it too. Well, perhaps so. I nod my head, and I think to myself, he has taken a drop too much and is talking nonsense. But he swore that during election time he lived on it and had a little money over for later. <laughs> I'm sure I don't see how. But, joking apart, it is not our affair whether one or the other is president, 
It won't make much difference to us. The fact is, I often feel very depressed. The tears fall from my eyes on the tobacco leaves that I am cutting, and I don't sleep well at night. Sometimes there is a noise in my ears, and my head aches whole days together, and there is no better remedy for all this than to take paper, pen, and ink, and write a letter to my dear Hannah. My precious wife, I cannot keep anything from you. I have to tell you everything. I am still reading the Mishnah. I have got no Talmud yet. And do you know why? Because I have had to make another outlay. You know that it is everywhere the same world. Although here they cry without stopping, Liberty, liberty, it isn't worth an onion. Here, too, they dislike Jews. They are, if possible, more contemptuous of their appearance. There are no dogs that bark at them in the street and tear their skirts, but there are plenty of hooligans here also. As soon as they catch sight of a capote, footnote meaning a kind of cloak, end of footnote, there is a cry, Jew, Jew, which is the same as Zahida, footnote, which means Russian term of contempt in contradistinction to Yevre Hebrew, end of footnote, with us. And they throw stones and mud. There is no lack of mud here, either. So what could I do? I did what all the Jews do here. I tucked away my earlocks behind my ears, and I bought, to be paid for by degrees, a custom they have, German clothes. There was an end to the money. And you too, Hannah Lee, when you come, will have to dress differently, for a custom stultifies a law, and it is their custom. And as to your writing that you don't like Jenendel, I cannot see why. What ails you at her? It is not for me to set other people right. Besides, I am sure she only does it all for Parnosha. She is as modest by nature as any other Jewish daughter. All day long, while Lieb the reader and I are at the factory, she cooks and washes and sweeps out the rooms. It is only in the evening that she goes with her father to their places of amusement, where she sings and plays and dances before the public. I sit by myself at home, read Torah, and write to you. Towards midnight they come home, we drink tea together, and we go to bed. And as to your saying, you think Jenendil stole the spoon which was afterwards missing, that is nonsense. Jenendil may not be very pious as regards the faith, but she would never think of touching other people's property. For goodness sake, don't ever let her hear of it. She treats me like her own child and is always asking me if I don't need a clean shirt or a glass of tea. She is really and truly a good girl. She gives all her earnings to her father and treats him in a way he doesn't deserve, although at times he comes home very cheerful and talks nineteen to the dozen. And Lieb the reader has told me that he is collecting a dowry for her, and that as soon as he has the first thousand dollars, he will find her a bridegroom and marry her according to the laws of Moses and of Israel, and she will not have to strain her throat for the public any more. I don't know if he really means it, but I hope so. God grant he may succeed and rid her of the ugly Parnosa. Jenendil was there when he said this, and blushed for shame, as a Jewish girl should do, so she is evidently agreed. I implore you, dearest Hannah, to put away calumny and evil speaking. That is not right. It only does for gossips in a small town. And you, Hannah dear, must come to America. Here the women are different less flighty, more serious, and as occupied as the men. To return to the subject, your Shmuel Moshe is no tailor or shoemaker to throw over his wife for another woman. You mustn't imagine such a thing. It is an insult. You know that your words pierce my heart like knives, and if Lieb the reader and his daughter knew of it, they would forsake me, and I should be left alone in a desert. It would be a calamity, for I don't know the language, only a few words, and I should be quite helpless. And now I beg of you, my dear Hannah, I beg very much, take the child's hand and guide it across the paper, so that it may write me something. Let me see at least a mark or two it has made. Lord of the world, how often I get away in a corner and I have a good cry. And why? Because I was not found worthy to teach my child the law. And as if I were not suffering enough, there come your letters and strew salt on my wounds. Look here. Today, Lieb the reader asked me, and Jenendel too, here she is called Sophie, 
nodded her head to go with them and hear her sing and see her dance, and I wouldn't. Leave the readers at foolish chosid. She turned up her nose. But I don't care. I shall go my own ways, and not a hair's breadth will I turn aside. Keep well, you and our child. Such is the wish of your husband, Shmuel Moshe. Please don't let on about the clothes. Not a soul in our town must know of it, or I would be ashamed to lift my eyes. S.M. End of section 51. Section 52 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracks, Bangalore, India. www.humanityhelps.me Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 52 the woman mistress hana a packet of letters to fourth letter to my worthy wife mistress hana i have written ten letters without mentioning genendel's name i have not even mentioned her father lieb the reader after a great deal of trouble i have gone into another lodging at a chauchaise and haven't seen her for weeks and yet you go on writing nothing but Genendil and Genendil and Sophie and Sophie. What is it you want of her? What? May I be well, and may you be well, and may it be granted us to meet again in peace with the child as surely as I saw Sophie come into the factory to meet her father, and the director himself went up to her and began to talk to her and to pay her compliments. And although I did not understand what he said, I know he meant no good by it, and he wanted to stroke her cheek. Well, what do you think? She gave him such a slap across the hand that I was dumbfounded, and you should have seen the way she turned away from him and went out. I was just delighted. So you see that, in spite of everything, Genendel is a good girl, and that you are unjust to her. You tell me I shall be caught like a fish in a net and such like rubbish, I swear to you as it were by the Torah on the Day of Atonement, that it is a lie, that for your sake I have gone away from her and avoid her as far as possible. If we do meet, I answer a hundred words with a nod. Once more upon my faith, you are unjust to her. Heaven forbid you sin before God. But that is nothing. I would have passed it over as usual, only it has led to something so dreadful that God help us. I would rather the earth had swallowed me up than that I had lived to endure the shame. Last week I was taken poorly while at work. I grew giddy and fainted. When I came to myself, I was in bed in my own room. Beside the bed stood a doctor. He said it was a fever. I was laid up for ten days, and Leap the reader never left me the whole time and nursed me as if I had been his own child. Afterward, when I had recovered full consciousness, I learned that while I lay in the fever, Sophie used to come in too and visit me. And it was just then there came one of your postcards in which you pour out upon her the bitterness of your heart. They most certainly read it because I was lying in a fever. And while you were writing your ugly words and calumnies, they, so to say, were risking their lives for me. They sent for doctors, made up my bed and remade it, gave me medicine and even pawned a few of their treasures so that help should be there. They even brought me a bottle of wine. I never touched a drop upon my word, but they meant it well. 
Besides that, they measured the height of the fever three times a day with a little glass tube. The doctors here order it to be done. And who told me all this? The butcher and his wife. Had it not been for Lieb the reader and Sophie, you would be a widow. And at the very same time, you write such foolish things. Fay, it is a shame. I really don't know how you are to come to America, how you are to live in America. I hope, dear Hanali, that you will throw off this foolishness and not darken my life with any more such letters. I often don't sleep at night. I imagine I see you plainly sitting at the table writing to me. You write and scratch out and write and scratch out. And I see the letter, but I cannot read the words at the distance, and it grieves me very much that I cannot read the letter so far off. And you take the pen and put it into the child's hand. The child is in your lap and guide its fingers. And you see, my dear wife, that I send you five dollars every week that I manage with very little, and I have only three shirts all together. I cannot ask Sophie to buy me any, and the Shoshe's wife has given birth to a baby and is not yet about again. The circumcision, please God, will be tomorrow. Yes, but that is not to the point. What I mean is, be reasonable for your own sake and for the sake of me, your husband, Shmuel Moje. A postscript written sideways down the whole length of the letter. I have this minute received another letter from you. And now, my Hanali, I tell you once and for all, it is enough to make one's hair stand on end and hardly to be believed. You write that you may as well let your hair grow and talk with gentlemen, that you also can dance and sing, and that you will go to the rebbe's and get him to send a special death to both of us. What do you mean? What words are these? Lord of the world, what has come to you? I think and think till I don't know what to think. This is my advice. Put away your evil speaking and calumnies and curses. They are not for such as you. And I tell you simply this, that if you do not soon write the letter, a good Jewess ought to write, I shall send and fetch the child away without you. Do you hear? Otherwise, I shall throw myself into the sea. It is enough, heaven forbid, to drive one mad. Your husband, S.M. End of section 52. Recording by Tracks, Bangalore, India. www.humanityhelps.me Section 53 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz, translated by Helena Frank. Section 53 The Woman at Mistress Hannah, a Packet of Letters. First Letter. Two letters which Hannah received from her relative in Lublin and one from her brother. To my friend, the excellent lady and esteemed and worthy woman, Mistress Hannah. Dear Hannah, you were a whole fool and half a prophet when you wrote me a second letter, because the first one fell into the hands of my husband, and he put it into his pocket and forgot to give it me. Such is his way. He cares for nothing except eating and drinking. But when I got the second letter, it occurred to me to look in his pocket, and whoso seeks, finds. Hannah Lee Crone, I felt, reading your bitter words, as if I were being struck on the head with an axe. I was stunned with grief. But I soon composed myself and thought, for instance, if my scatterbrain of a husband ran away to America, well, I should just let him run and pay the piper into the bargain. Now think, my whole Parnosia, as you know, is tar. 
Footnote. This was an important article of trade required for the peasants' carts, etc. End of footnote. And I don't require his assistance. Indeed, I can't stand his coming into the shop with the airs he gives himself. If the customer is a woman, he won't answer her, the chosid, won't take the money from her hand, and if it's a man, likely as not he asks too little. If he takes the money, they palm off false coins on him, and if he is so kind once in a while as to take up a piece of chalk and make out a bill for me, it is a bill. May they add up my sins in the other world as he adds up my wares. And as to your husband not having left you a divorce, I am not so very surprised. My husband has no such easy time of it, and yet he doesn't divorce me, and why should he? Does he want for anything? He has a nice lodging, and when he comes home, supper is ready and the bed made at the proper time, and every Sabbath he gets a clean white shirt. Many's the time I've begged and prayed of him to go to all devils. Not he. Do you think he'd budge an inch? And when I scold him and throw things at his head, he gets into a corner, makes a pitiful face, brings crocodile tears into his eyes, and I am so foolish as to relent. I give him food and drink, and off he goes. And as to what you say about your lawsuit, you know, Sister Hannah, I have quite a celebrated lawyer, because for my sins I have a never-ending case against cooks, the huzzies. I assure you, Hannah Lee, servants such as we have in Lublin are not to be found anywhere. How shall I describe them? Always swilling and stuffing. And they steal anything they can lay hands on and run away before the quarter is out and then they lodge a complaint against me, because I haven't paid them a quarter's wages. And in court, nowadays they don't make a particle of difference between a servant girl and a mistress, and I have to stand with her side by side. I mayn't open my mouth to say a word, otherwise the judge rings a bell and imposes a fine of up to three rubles. So I never go into court alone, but have engaged an excellent lawyer whose mouth drops sulfur in pitch, and he sees me through. He once told me himself that the judge had frequently wished to imprison me on some ridiculous pretext, such as tearing a girl's hair or giving her a slap, but he cannot do it because my advocate has all the law books in his head, knows all the laws, every single one chooses out the best for me and flings them in the judge's face so that he sits there like a dummy and willy-nilly has to write acquitted. No sooner had I read your letter and found the first one in my husband's pocket than I hastened to my lawyer, and he received me most politely and asked me to be seated on the plush sofa. I told him your whole story from Alf to Ta, down to every detail, and he'd listened attentively to it all, although the anteroom was crowded with people waiting. He listened and walked up and down the room. Then he sighed and said that, according to the laws, a daughter had equal rights with the son and should inherit a share. So far, good. But there is the following hitch. A wife cannot summons anyone without her husband's knowledge, because she is under his jurisdiction and must be given power of attorney by him. And when I told him that you, unhappily, were a grass widow, that your husband had deserted you, and that, in my opinion, you were free to do as you please, he planted himself in front of me and shook his head. That meant by no means. And he went to a bookcase, took out one book after the other, looked in, put it down, looked in, and put it down, and so on with any number of books, little and big and bigger. One, heaven forgive me, was as fat as a pig. And in this one he apparently found what he was in search of, for he stood over it a long time. And then he told me that if, after five years from the date of your desertion, you bring him a paper from the justice of your town to certify that your husband has not once shown himself in those five years, he, the lawyer, will put in a plea for you in court, and the court will give you permission to summons your brother. This is what he said. I give it you word for word. I offered him a rouble, and he made a wry face, evidently not enough, but he took it. Send me the rouble, Hannah Lee Crone, as soon as you can, for trade is slack, and tar is a drug in the market. To return to the matter at hand, it is what I always said, and I say it again, the Holy Torah, and their law, Ledeville, of course, also, 
has handed us over the mercy of bandits. A man, a dummy, a bolster, can divorce his wife when he likes, either in person or by proxy, and a worthy woman, like myself, for instance, cannot get rid of an idler like mine for love or money. If we go together to a family gathering, he is stuffed with fish and meat and all good things, and I get a cup of chicory and milk. When he sits in the booth at Tabernacles, one has to send him the best of everything, and I live on bones. I share the three weeks, nine days, and all the fasts, but the rejoicing of the law is his. He goes to a rebbe, and they give him honey with apples. And what will paradise, when it comes to that, mean for me? I shall be the idiot's footstool. He will sit in a grandfather's chair, and I shall be his footstool. In this world, he is a feeble creature and is afraid of me. But how will it be in the other world? Don't ask me. I tell you plainly, if he gives me the least shove with his foot, the Almighty alone knows what will happen. To return, what would you get by a divorce? Believe me, all dogs have the same face. Not one of them is worth a dryer. You know my sister Miriam suffered through her husband ten years before she could obtain a divorce, and then she had to leave him her money and her clothes. In a word, all she had. Nice thing, wasn't it? She married again and was out of the frying pan into the fire, another idler to feed. She wanted a second divorce. He was satisfied, but she couldn't afford to pay for it. In short, dear Hannah, our mother Eve sinned, and we suffer for it. And we always shall suffer, for there is no escape from a husband, even in the grave. We have been sold to be servants and slaves in the other world, too. So it was aforetime, so it is now, and so it will be in the future world. One has to suffer. For what is to be done if the Almighty wills it so? Therefore, dear Hannah, have faith in God, blessed is he. Keep well and forget your husband, who has probably forgotten you. That is always the way when they go to America. At first they write honeyed letters and send money, then less and less. Then they write and send money once a year, and then... Once in seven years, they don't need their wives out there. They have other women, better, livelier. May I be forgiven for saying so, but in Lublin, in the Jewish quarter, there isn't a house without a grass widow. Wash your hands of him, I tell you, and forget. Imagine yourself a real widow or a divorced woman. Turn your attentions to the onion. May his blessed name send you success in business and preserve you whichever way you turn. Such is the wish of your relative. The signature is undecipherable. I beg of you to send me the rouble as soon as possible, because my husband, gorger and tippler that he is, is angry with me for having given it. The same undecipherable signature. End of section 53. Section 54 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz, translated by Helena Frank, Section 54, The Woman Mistress Hannah, A Packet of Letters 3, Second Letter. To my sister Hannah. First, my dear sister, I let you know that we are all well except my wife, Eva Guttel, who, not of you be it said, is never free from cough for an instant and who no sooner is the wedding over must go to Warsaw to consult a doctor. I send you enclosed an invitation to the wedding. Mind you come and enjoy yourself. Only do not, for mercy's sake, spoil my daughter's happiness and keep all contentions till the wedding is over. You need not feel called upon to bring any present. If, however, you are troubled about appearances, you are sure to find something in the house that will do. I shall not take it amiss. Blood is thicker than water, and a sister is a sister. And as to what you say about having no clothes to come in, that is nonsense. You can borrow a dress of someone or other, either there or here. And as to what you say about not being able to comfort yourself for the child that has died, you know, dear sister, he gave and he hath taken away. Children are a pledge from God, and if God wishes to take back the deposit, we must not even brood over it and try to think why. God forbid. 
And as to your being afraid of your husband finding out that the child is dead and breaking with you altogether, that is another useless anticipation. Believe me, sister, it is quite foolish, because if it is true, as people say that Shmuel Moshe is Shmuel Moshe no longer, he is treading other paths. It will be all the same, child or no child. He doesn't want you, and you cannot hold to him." And if, as I trust, that is all an invention, a calumny, and if, as I firmly believe, Shmuel Moshe is still Shmuel Moshe, the learned and pious Jew, then you have nothing to fear. On the contrary, with half the expense it would be much easier to have you out to join him, and you will live in peace and plenty. And as to your having had no news of him for so long, is it any wonder? I believe it is across the sea. How many ships, preserve us, are wrecked on the way? How many postmen lose their lives on such an errand? And perhaps the ships have to pass the spot where, as the Book of the Covenant says, the waters stand on a heap, and there is peril of death. Thank his dear name that your Shmuel Moshe crossed in safety. I consider this fleeing to lands beyond the sea a disgrace and a shame. It is a sign of want of trust, because he who trusts knows that God helps whom he will, and he shrinks from endangering both body and soul. For they say that America is as dangerous to the soul as the sea to the body. They say people throw off their Jewishness on board ship as soon as the sea gives them a toss. They soon begin to eat bread baked by Gentiles, forbidden food, to dress German fashion. Women wear wigs, even, it has been said, their own hair. And the proof that America is dangerous to the soul is that there is not one good Jew in all America, and I cannot imagine how one would exist there, where one could get advice in questions of Parnosia, or if one were ill, or anything else happened to one. I tell you that the man who goes into Satan's domain of his own accord is responsible for his soul, for he is like a foolish bird flying into a net, and particularly a learned Jew, because the greater the man, the greater the danger, the more is the evil one set on his destruction, and decoys him with either riches or beautiful women. The evil one has tools for the work at hand. And therefore, my advice to you is, so long as you do not know what is happening there, forget. If you earn your livelihood with the onions, well and good. And if, heaven forbid you cannot, I can give you other advice. If you come to the wedding, I will make it all right between you and my wife. We are, after all, one family, and you know that my wife, Eva Goodall, is really very good-natured. She is sure to forgive you, and when all is smooth again and she goes to Warsaw after the wedding, then you will remain here and be housemistress. And when, please God, she comes back cured, she will still find a place for you at the table and a bed in the house. Times are bad, but a sister is a sister, and one cuts the herring into thinner slices. But besides... All that we have, a mighty God, shall he not be able to feed one of his creatures, and that, a woman, nonsense? And for goodness sake, come to the wedding in time, so that you may be able to lend Eva Goodall a hand. It is no more than one has a right to ask a sister-in-law. You would not wish, as things are nowadays, to have us hire extra help? Only be sure and let everything I have said to you about the future remain between ourselves. Eva Goodall is not to know what I have written to you. The thing ought to come of itself, quite of itself. You know, Eva Goodall does not like one to interfere in domestic concerns, and I am sure the thing will arrange itself. A woman is a woman, even if she wears a top hat. That is why I write to you when Eva Goodall is not at home. She has gone to engage the badgen. Footnote. Wedding jester and improvisator. End of footnote and the musician. I shall not even tell her I sent you an invitation. Let her imagine you were so good and so right-thinking as to come of your own accord. And may he whose name is blessed comfort you together with all that morn in Israel, and spread the wings of his compassion over all abandoned women. Amen. May it seem good in his sight. Sister Hannah, whether you stay where you are or remain with us for good, come to the wedding. You simply must, and you shall not repent it. It will be a fine wedding. It may be that he himself, may his days and years increase, will be present. 
It will cost me a fortune, but it is worth it. You see that such a wedding is not to be missed. From me, your brother, Menaka Mendel. My wife, Eva Goodall, has just come in from market, and, a token that heaven wills it so, she tells me that I am not to hide my letter from her, and that she bears you no grudge. She advises you to sell the onions, buy a dress, and come to the wedding looking like other people, as befits the bride's aunt. She also says that no present is necessary, and that one can trade in onions here, too. I repeat that my wife, Eva Goodall, is both kind-hearted and wise, and that if you will not be obstinate, everything will come right. You will see. Your brother, M. M. End of section 54. Section 55 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz, translated by Helena Frank, section 55. The Woman Mistress Hannah, a packet of letters, four. An unfinished letter from Hannah to her husband. Good luck to you, my dear, faithful husband. Good luck to you. Here's good news from us, and may I ever hear the like from you. Amen. May it be his will. We are indeed, as you say, united for all time in this world and the other. I let you know first, dear husband, that my brother Meneka Mendel and his wife Eva Goodall, may they live to see the days of the Messiah, forgave me everything and sent for me in a lucky hour to their daughter's wedding, Belsasha's wedding. It was a very fine one, fine as fine can be. Praise God that I was found worthy to see it. There was every kind of meat, birds and beef and fish, just fish and stuffed fish and all sorts of other dishes besides wine and brandy, something of everything. And the whole thing was such a success, so elegant. And I myself cooked the meat, stuffed the fish, made the stew, set up the dinner, and also saw to the marketing beforehand. I was housemistress. I was waitress. I did not go merely to enjoy myself. I sold my stock of onions, made myself a dress of sorts, and went to my relations, agreeably to their wish, a whole week before the wedding, because there was no one to do the work. The bride was taken up with her clothes. She spent the time with the tailor, the shoemaker, and even the jeweler up to the very last minute. And poor Eva Goodall, my sister-in-law, has a cough, and they say her liver is not what it should be. So I was everybody, before the wedding and after the wedding, only not at the wedding, during which I felt very tired and done up. I sat in a corner and cried for joy because I had been counted worthy to marry my brother's child and because she had such an elegant wedding and I was not turned out in a hurry when it was over either. Directly after it, my sister-in-law, health and strength to her, started to consult a doctor in Lublin as to which doctor she ought to see in Warsaw. Then she left for Warsaw and went the round of all the celebrated doctors Thence she traveled to some other place to drink the waters, mineral waters they are called, and during the whole six months of her absence I was mistress of the house. May the Almighty remember it to them for good and reward them. There was no cook. I did the cooking, and I drank delight out of it as from a well. In the first place I had no time for thinking and brooding, and thereby saved from going mad or even melancholia. And where, indeed, should I have found it? Business, thank heaven, was brisk. The public house is always full, and the counter strewn with the gold and silver of Jews and Gentiles, Le Hadville. And my sister-in-law, Eva Goodall's stuffed fish, are celebrated for miles around. And there the people sit and eat and drink. And if ever I began to think and wanted to think, Belsasha, long life to her, soon reminded me of where I was and she with sharp eyes, bless her, nothing escapes them. And so it went merrily on, and I was so overjoyed at being housemistress there that once I spat blood, but only once. Menaka Mendel saw it, and he told me to be sure and behave as if nothing had happened, because if people knew it, they would avoid his house. 
Yosel, the innkeeper over the way, would soon cry consumption, and there would be an end of it, and grass growing down our side of the street. But Belle Sasha is the cleverer of the two. She soon discovered that it was not consumption, that I had swallowed a fishbone, and it scratched my throat. And so, that I should not suffocate, she gave me a blow between the shoulders to loosen it, and all for love's sake, such a blow that the fishbone went down, only my bones ached a bit. But all's well that ends well, and Eva Goodle has come back from drinking the waters. She has come back, thank God, in the best of health and spirits, a sight for sore eyes, and she has brought presents, the most beautiful presents, for herself, for her husband, for her daughter and her son-in-law, lovely things. But there was nothing for me. She said that I, heaven forbid, was no servant to be given presents and wages. Had I not been housemistress? Had not Eva Goodle herself told me fifty times that I was mistress and could do as I liked? And no sooner was Eva Goodle back than she discovered that Maneka Mendel had not been near the Rebbe the whole time, and she wrung her fingers till the bones cracked and immediately sent me out to the marketplace to hire a conveyance. Maneka Mendel drove to the holy man that same day. And the next morning, Eva Goodle gave me some good advice, which was to make up my bundle and go, because she was there again and had Belsasha to help her. I should be fifth wheel to the cart and might go mad from having nothing to do. She advised me to go back whence I came, or to stay in the place and do as I thought best. She would not be responsible either way. I had slept my last night in her house. The next one I spent walking the streets with my bundle under my arm. You see, my dear husband, that I am doing very well. You need send me no more money as you used to do. You had better give it to Lieb the reader to buy you a Talmud or to Jen and Dill Sophia to buy you shirts. And mind she tries them on you herself to see how they fit. Is it not America? You see, my dear good husband, I harbor no more unjust suspicions. I never say now that Jenendil stole either the spoon or my husband. I know it is not her fault, and I am convinced that his blessed name only meant to do us a kindness when he brought you and leave the reader together on the ship so that he should take care of you. It is all just as you wrote. There is only one thing that will never be as you think. You may jump out of your skin, but you will never send for the child to take it away from me to America, because our child, for your sake and for that of your pious forefathers, has been gone this long time. It has been hidden somewhere in the burial ground, in a little room without a door, without a window. You may cry to heaven, but you shall not know where its little bones lie. No tombstone, nothing to mark it, nothing at all. Go, look for the wind in the fields. Ashkara footnote, croup, end footnote, has taken it under her wing. And since you have such a wonderful memory and remember everything I said and everything I did, I will tell you a story which you may recollect. It is a story about a shawl I did not know what to do with. Should I put it on and run for the doctor for the child, or stop up the broken pane with it to keep the snow from blowing in, or wrap it round the child because the poor thing was suffocating with its throat? And it was cold, bitterly cold. I ran through and fro several times from the window to the cradle to the door and back from the door to the window. I tell you I ran. I think, my dear husband, you will not forget that moment because, as you say, we are bound one to the other, you to me and both of us to the child, and now the child is not there. We two may as well go too. Well, what will Jenendale say? To tell the truth, I have decided to let my hair grow and dress as they dress in America, and do you know that besides this, I have a sweet voice and can chant all the prayers, and now since I have been at my brother Maneka Mendel's, I have heard drunken peasants sing all sorts of songs. And I have learned them, and I sing every whit as well as Jenendil, if not better. And at night, when I slept under the open sky, the Queen of Sheba came and taught me to dance. And a whole night long I danced with the Queen of Sheba in the eye of the moon. And you, my dear Shmuel Moshe, have made a bad bargain, for I am better than Jenendil. 
because I remember quite well that she had two moles, one on the left ear and one on the right cheek and rather a crooked nose, and I, you know, have a perfectly clear skin without a mole anywhere. You thought that only Genadil could sing and dance every Friday night and let her hair grow, that other people were not up to that. But I am not angry with you, heaven forbid. Hold to her. It is enough for me to have the child's grave. I shall go and build myself a little house there and sit in it through the night till the cock crows. I shall talk to the child very low and softly about his father Shmuel Moshe, and that will delight him. And if you come yourself or send any one to fetch the child, I shall scratch out his eyes with my nails, because the child is mine, not Genendil's. May her name and her remembrance perish, and may you and she... The letter is unfinished. It was found together with the other letters in the pocket of the mad Hannah. End of section 55「Section 56 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beatrix Mersch of FramingNoise.com. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 56 In the Pond. Once upon a time there was a pond. It had a corner to itself, and lay quite apart from the rest of the field, where beasts were wont to graze and herd boys to fling stones. A high bank, set with briars, screened it from the wind, and it had a slimy, shiny green covering, in which the breeze tore a hole once in twelve months. In the pond there dwelt, according to the order of nature, a colony of quite small worms which fed on still smaller ones. The pond was neither long nor wide, not even deep, and if the little worms could neither discover a bottom nor swim to shore, they had only the thick slime and the water weeds and the fallen twigs to thank for it. The geography of the pond was in its infancy. Conceit, on the other hand, flourished, and Fancy had it all her own way beneath the green covering, and the two together sat spinning and weaving. And they wove between them a legend of the beginning of things, a truly worm-like tradition. The pond is the great sea, and the four streams of paradise flow into it. Hideka brings gold, that is the slime in which they find their nourishment, and the other three bring flowers, the water weeds among which they play hide and seek on holidays, pearls, frog spawn, and corals the little orange fungi on the rotting twigs. The green cover, the slimy cap on the surface of the pond, is the heaven stretched out over the ocean, a special heaven for their own particular world. Fragments of eggshell, which have fallen into it, play the part of stars, and a rotten pumpkin does duty for the sun. The chance stones flung into the pond by the herd boys are, of course, hailstones flung by heaven at the head of sinners. And when their heaven opened, and a few beams of the real sun penetrated to a wormy brain, then they believed in hell. But life in the pond was a pleasant thing. People were satisfied with themselves and with one another. When one lives in the great sea, one is as good as a fish oneself. One worm would call another tench, pike. Crocodile and leviathan would be engraved on tombstones. Roach was the greatest insult, and haddock not to be forgiven, even on the Day of Atonement. Meanwhile, astronomy, poetry, and philosophy blossomed like the rose. The bits of eggshell were counted over and over again, till everyone was convinced of the absurdity of the attempt. Romantic poets harped on the heavenly academy in a thousand different keys. Patriots were likened to the stars, stars to ladies' eyes, and the ladies themselves to paradise, or else to purgatory. Philosophy transferred the souls of the pious to the rotten pumpkin. In short, nothing was wanting. Life had all the colors of the rainbow. 
In due time, a code of law was framed with hundreds of commentaries. They introduced a thousand rules and regulations, and if a worm had the slightest desire to make a change, he had but to remember what the world would think, blush, regret, and do penance. Once, however, there was a catastrophe. It was caused by a herd of swine. Dreadful feet crashed through the heavens, stamped down the slime, bruised the corals, made havoc of the flowers, and plunged the entire little world back into chaos. Some of the worms were asleep under the slime, and worms sleep fast and long. These escaped. When they rose out of the mud, the heavens had already swum together again and united, but whole heaps of squeezed, squashed, and suffocated worms were lying about unburied, witnesses in death of the past awful event. "'What has happened?' was the cry, and search was made for some living soul who should know the cause of the calamity." But such a living soul was not easy to find. It is no light thing to survive a heaven. Those who were not stamped upon had died of fright, and those who were not killed by fright had died of a broken heart. The remainder committed suicide. Without a heaven, what is life? One had survived. But when he had declared to them that the heaven they now saw was a new heaven, fresh as it were from the shop, and that the former heaven had been trodden in of beasts, when he asserted that a worm heaven is not eternal, that only the universal heaven is, perhaps, eternal, then they saw clearly that his mind had become deranged. He was assisted with the deepest compassion and conveyed to an asylum for lunatics. End of section 56 Recording by Beatrix Mersch of FramingNoise.com Section number 57 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Talia. You can find me at VOByT.com. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section number 57. The Hanukkah Light. My top coat was already in my hand, and yet I could not decide to go or not to go to give my lesson. Oh, it's so unpleasant outside. Such horrible weather. A mile's trudge. And then what? Once more. Pakar. Once more, the old housemaster, who has got through his sixty-odd years of life without knowing any grammar, who has been ten times to Leipzig, two or three times to Danzig, who once but all landed in Constantinople, and who cannot understand such a waste of money. Grammar, indeed, a fine bargain. Then the young housemaster, who allows that it is far more practical to wear earlocks, a fur cap, and a braided caftan to consult with a good Jew, and not to know any grammar, not that he is otherwise than orthodox himself, but he is obliged, as a merchant, to mix with men, to wear a hat and a stiff shirt, to permit his wife to visit the theater, his daughter to read books, and engage a tutor for his son. My father, of course, knows best, but one must move with the times. He cannot make up his mind to be left in the lurch by the times. I only beg of you, he said to me. Don't make an unbeliever of the boy. I will give you, he said, as much as you would pay for a whole lot of grammar, if you will not teach him that the earth goes around the sun. And I promised that he should never hear it from me, because, because this was my only lesson, and I had a sick mother at home. To go, or not to go. The whole family will be present to watch me when I give my lesson. She also? She sits in the background, always deep in a book. Now and again she lifts her long silken lashes, and a little brightness is diffused through the room. But so seldom, so seldom. And what is to come of it? Nothing can come of it except 
heartache. Listen, my mother's weak voice from the bed recalls me to myself. The floodster says, if only I had a pair of warm woolen socks, I might creep about the room a little. That, of course, decides it. Except for the lady of the house, who has gone to play, as usual, without the knowledge of her father-in-law, I find the whole family assembled around the pinchbeck samovar. The young housemaster acknowledges my greeting with a negligent, a good year to you, and goes on turning over his palm a pack of playing cards. Doubtless he expects company. The old housemaster, in a peaked cap and a voluminous Turkish dressing gown, does not consider it worth while to remove from his lips the long pipe with its amber mouthpiece, or to lift his eyes off his well-worn book of devotions. He merely gives a nod and once more sinks his attention in the portion appointed for Hanukkah. She also is intent in her reading. Only her book, as usual, is a novel. My arrival makes a disagreeable impression on my pupil. Oh, I say, and he springs up from his seat at the table and lowers his black ringed little head defiantly. Lessons today? Why not? smiles his father. But it's Hanukkah, answers the boy, tapping the floor with his foot and pointing to the first light, which has been placed in the window behind the curtain and fastened to a bit of wood. Quite right, growls the old gentleman. Well, well, says the younger one with indifference. You must excuse him for once. I have an idea that she has become suddenly paler, that she bends lower over her book. I wish them all a good night, but the young house buster will not let me go. You must stay to tea. And end to the rascals with poppy seed, cries my pupil joyfully. He is quite willing to be friends so long as there is no question of Picard. I am defiant as to accepting, but the boy seizes my hand, and with a roguish smile on his restless features, he places a chair for me opposite of his sister's. Has he observed anything? On my side, of course, I mean. She is always abstracted and lost in her reading. Very likely she looks upon me as an idler, or even worse. She does not know that I have a sick mother at home. It will soon be time for you to dress, exclaims her father impatiently. Soon, very soon, Tarashi, she answers hastily, and her pale cheeks take a tinge of color. The young housemaster abandons himself once more to his reflections. My pupil sends a top spinning across the table. The old man lays down his book and stretches out a hand for his tea. Involuntarily, I glance at the Hanukkah light opposite to me in the window. It burned so sadly, so low, as if ashamed in the presence of the great silvered lamp hanging over the dining table and lighting so brilliantly the elegant tea service. I feel more depressed than ever and do not observe that she is offering me a glass of tea. With lemon, her melancholy voice rouses me. Perhaps you prefer milk, says her father. Look out, the milk is smoked, cries my pupil warningly. An exclamation escapes her. How can you be so? Silence once more. Nothing but a sound of sipping and clink of spoons. Suddenly, my pupil is moved to inquire. After all, teacher, what is Hanukkah? Ask the rabbi tomorrow in school, says the old man impatiently. Ugh, is a prompt reply. I should think a tutor knew better than a rabbi. The old man cast an angry glance at his son as if to say, Do you see? I want to know about Hanukkah too, she exclaimed softly. Well, well, says the young housemaster to me. Let us hear your version of Hanukkah, by all means. It happened, I began, in the days when the Greeks oppressed us in the land of Israel. The Greeks, but the old man interrupts me with a sour look. In the benediction it says, the wicked kingdom of Yavon. It comes to the same thing, observes his son. What we call Yavon, they call Greeks. The Greeks, I resume, 
oppressed us terribly. It was in our darkest hour. As a nation, we were threatened with extinction. After a few ill-started risings, the life seemed to be crushed out of us. The last gleam of hope had faded, although in our own country we were trodden underfoot like worms. The young housemaster has long ceased to pay me any attention. His ear is tuned to the door. He is intent on listening for the arrival of a guest. But the old housemaster fixes me with his eye, and, when I have a second time used the word oppressed, he can no longer contain himself. A man should be explicit. Oppressed? What does that even convey to me? They force us to break the Sabbath. They forbade us to keep our festivals, to study the law, even to practice circumcision. You play preference, inquires the young gentleman suddenly, or perhaps even poker. Once more there is silence, and I continue. The misfortune was aggravated by the fact that the nobility and the wealthy began to feel ashamed of their own people and to adopt Greek ways of living. They used to frequent the gymnasiums. She and the old gentleman look at me in astonishment. In the gymnasium of those days, I hasten to add, there was no studying. They used to practice gymnastics, naked, men and women together. The two pairs of eyes lower their gaze, but the young housemaster raises his with a flash. What did you say? I make no reply, but I go on to speak of the theaters, where the men fought wild beasts and oxen, and of other Greek manners and customs which must have been contrary to the Jewish tradition. The Greeks thought nothing of all of this. They were bent on effacing every trace of independent national existence. They set up an altar in the street with an aboda zora and commanded us to sacrifice to it. What is that? she asks in Polish. I explain. The old man adds excitingly, and a swine too. They were to sacrifice a swine to it. And there was found a Jew to approach the altar with an offering. But that same day, the old Maccabeus, with his five sons, had come down from the hills. And before the Greek soldiers could intervene, the miserable apostate was lying in his blood. And the altar was torn down. In one second, the rebellion was ablaze. The Maccabees, with handful of men, drove out the far more numerous Greek garrison. The people were set free. Is that the victory we should celebrate with our poor little illumination? With our Hanukkah lights? What? The old man, trembling with rage, springs out of his chair. That is the Hanukkah light? Come here, wretched boy. He screams to his grandson, who instead of obeying, shrinks from him in terror. The old man brings his fist down on the table so that the glasses ring again. It means, when we had driven out the unclean sons of Yavon, there was only one little cruise of holy olive oil left. But a fit of coughing stops his breath, and his son hastens up and assists him into the next room. I wish to leave, but she detains me. You are against assimilation, then? she asks. To assimilate, I reply, is to consume, to eat to digest. We assimilate beef and bread and others wish to assimilate us, to eat us up like bread and meat. She is silent for a few seconds and then she asks anxiously, but will there always, always be wars and dissensions between the nations? Oh no, I answer. One point they must all agree in the end, and that is humanity. When each is free to follow his own bent, then they will all agree. She is lost in thought. She has more to say, but there comes a tap at the door. Mama, she exclaims under her breath and escapes after giving me her hand for the first time. On the next day but one, while I was still in bed, I received a letter by the postman The envelope bore the name of her father's firm, Jacob Bernholtz. 
my heart beat like a sledgehammer. Inside, there were only ten rubles. My pay for the month that was not yet complete. Goodbye. Lesson. End of section number 57. This has been recorded by Talia. You can find me at vobyt.com. Section 58 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz, translated by Helena Frank. Section 58, The Poor Little Boy. Told by a man on a committee. Give me five kopecks for a night's shelter. No, I answer sharply and walk away. He runs after me with a look of canine entreaty in his burning eyes. He kisses my sleeve in vain. I cannot afford to give so much every day. The poor, I reflect, as I leave the soup kitchen, eat their fill quickly. The first time I saw the dirty, wizened little face with the sunken eyes, darkly burning, sorrowful, and yet intelligent eyes, it went to my heart. I had not even heard his request before an impulse seized me, and a groschen flew out of my pocket into his thin little hands. I remember quite well that my hand acted of its own accord, without waiting to ask my heart for its pity or my reason, whether with a pension of forty-one rubles, sixty-six kopecks a month, I could afford to give five kopecks in charity. His entreaty was an electric spark that fired every limb in my body, and every cell in every limb, and my reason was not informed of the fresh outlay till later, when the little boy, with a hop, skip, and a jump, had left the soup kitchen. Busy with my own and other people's affairs, I soon forgot the little boy, and yet not altogether. Somewhere inside my head, and without my knowing anything about it, there must have been held a meeting of practical thoughts, because the very next evening, when the little boy stopped me again, the same little boy with the broken, quavering accents, and asked me once more for a night's shelter in bed, the following considerations rose up from somewhere, ready prepared to the surface of my mind. A boy, seven or eight years old, ought not to beg. He ought not to hang about soup kitchens feeding on scraps before the plates are collected and removed. Would make a vagabond of him, a beggar. He would never come to any good if he went on like that. My hand had found its way into my pocket, but I caught it there and held it fast. Had I been pious, I should have reasoned thus. Is the merit I shall acquire really worth five kopecks? Should I not gain just as much by repeating the evening prayers, or by giving a hoarse groan during their recital? Not being pious, I thought only of the boy's good. My five kopecks will only do him harm and make a hopeless beggar of him, and I gave them to him, after all. My hand forced its way out of my pocket, and this time I did not even try to hold it back. Something pained me in the region of my heart, and the tears were not far from my eyes. Once more the little boy ran joyfully out of the soup kitchen. My heart grew light, and I felt a smile on my face. The third time it lasted longer, much longer. I had calculated betimes that my means will not allow of my giving every day in charity. Of course it is a pleasure to see the poor little wretch jump for joy, to notice the gleam of light in his young eyes, to know that... Thanks to your five kopecks, he will not pass the night in the street, but in the refuge, where he will be warm, and where, tomorrow morning, he will get a glass of tea and a roll. All that is a pleasure, certainly, but it is one that I, with my income, cannot allow myself. It is out of the question. Of course, I did not say all that to the little boy. I merely gave him some good advice. I told him that if he begged, he would come to a bad end, that every man, and he also must some day grow into a man, is in honor obliged to work. Work is holy, and he who seeks work finds in such likewise things out of books that could not make up to the little boy for the night refuge that could not so much as screen him till daylight from the rain and the snow. And all the while there he stood and kissed my sleeve and lifted his eyes to mine on the watch for some gleam of pity to prove that his words were not as peas thrown against a wall." and I felt all the time that he was not watching in vain, that my cold reasonings were growing warmer, and that his beseeching, dog-like eyes had a power I could not withstand, and that I must shortly surrender with my whole battery of reproofs and warnings. 
so I resolved as follows. I will give him something, and then tell him once and for all that he is not to beg any more, tell him sharply and decidedly, so that he may remember. I had not enough in coppers, so I changed a silver coin and gave him five kopecks. There, but you are not to come begging from me again, do you hear? Whence the... from me? As far as I knew, I had no such words in my mind. Anyway, I certainly did not intend to say them, and perhaps I would gladly have given a few kopecks not to have done so. I felt a sudden chill at my heart, as if I had torn away a bit of covering and left a part of it naked. But it was all over like a flash. My stern face, the hard metallic ring of my voice, my outstretched right hand, and outward-pointing left foot had done their work. I had a great attraction for that little boy. He stood there as if on hot coals. He wanted to run off so as to get earlier to the lodging-house, and yet he stayed on and listened, growing paler and paler, while a tear trembled on his childish lashes. There, and now don't beg any more. I wound up, do you hear? This is to be the very last time. The little boy th drew a deep breath and ran away. Today, today I have given him nothing. I will not break my word. I will know nothing of evasion. Footnote, as of those religious precepts which it is not possible to carry out literally. A given word is precious. One must be firm, otherwise there would be an end to everything. I think over again what I have just been saying, and feel quite pleased with myself. I cannot afford to give five kopecks in charity every day, and yet that was not the reason. It was the boy's own good I was thinking of, indeed, the good of all. What is the use of unsystematic charity, and how can there be system without a strict rule? With the little boy I had spoken simple Yiddish, with myself somewhat more learnedly. As I left the soup kitchen I reflected, the worst microbe in the body of the community is begging. The man who will not work has no right to eat, and so on. I had no sooner shut the door of the soup kitchen behind me than my feet sank deep into the mud. I ran my head against a wall and then plunged into the dark night. There was a dreadful wind blowing. The flames of the gas lamps trembled as with cold, and their flickering shine was reflected a thousandfold in the puddles in the street, so that the eyes were dazzled. It wailed plaintively as though a thousand souls were praying for Tikkun. Footnote, qualification for eternal bliss. Or a thousand little boys for five kopecks for a night's shelter. Bother that little boy. It would be a sin to drive a dog into the street on such a night. And yet the poor little boy will have to sleep out of doors. But what can I do? I have given him something three times. Does that go for nothing? Let somebody else give him five kopecks for once. I have done quite enough, coming out to the soup kitchen in this weather, with my sick chest and a cough and without a fur coat. Were I pious, it would have been self-interest on my part. I should have done it with a view to acquiring merit. I should have hastened home, turned into bed and gone to sleep, so that my soul might quickly fly to heaven and enter the good deed to her account. The good deed is the credit and the debit, a fat slice of Leviathan. I, when I went to the soup kitchen, had no reward in view. It was my kind nature that prompted me. As I walked and praised myself thus, my heart felt warm again. If other people had been praising me, I must needs have been ashamed and motioned them away with my hand. But I can listen to myself without blushing, and I should perhaps have gone on praising myself and have discovered other amiable traits in my character, had I not stepped with my half-souls. Heaven knows I had worn away the other half on the road to the soup kitchen, stepped with my half-souls right into the mud. Those who are engaged in a religious mission come to no hurt, but that is probably on the way out. On the way home, when the newly created angel is hastening heavenward, one may break one's neck. My feet are wet, and I feel chilled all through. I know to a certainty that I shall catch cold, that I have caught cold already. Presently I shall be coughing my heart out, and I feel a sting in my chest. A terror comes over me. It is not long since I spent four weeks in bed. It's not a thing to do, I say to myself, by way of reproach. No, certainly not. It's all very well as far as you are concerned, but what about your wife and child? What right have you to imperil their support? If the phrase had been a printed one, and I the reader of it, with my pencil in my hand, 
I should have known what to do. But the phrase was my own. I feel more and more chilled, and home is distant, and my galoshes are full of water, cold and heavy. The windows of a confectioner gleam brightly in front of me. It is the worst in all Warsaw. Their tea is shocking. But since there is no choice, I rush across the street and plunge into a warm mist. I order a glass of tea and take up a comic paper. The first illustrated joke that caught my eye was like a reflection of the state of things outside. The joke was called, Which Has Too Much? The weather in the picture is the weather out of doors. Two persons are advancing toward each other on the pavement. From one side comes a stout, middle-aged woman, well-nourished, in a silk dress, a satin cloak, and a white hat with feathers. She must have started on her walk, or to make a visit, in fine weather, and now she had been caught by the rain. Her face is one of dismay. She dreads the rain and the wind, if not for herself, at least for her hat. She hastens. Drops of perspiration appear on her white forehead. She hastens, but her steps are unsteady. Both her hands are taken up. In the left she holds the end of her silken train, already spattered with mud, and in the right a tiny silk parasol that scarcely covers the feathered hat on her head. She only requires a larger umbrella. To make up for that she has enough and to spare of everything else. Her face is free from care. It tells only of an abundance of all good things. Coming to meet her is a little girl, all skin and bone. She has perhaps long and beautiful hair, but no time to attend to it. It is matted and ruffled, and the wind tears round and round and seizes whole locks with which he whips her narrow shoulders. She wears a thin, tattered frock, and the wind clings round her, seeking a hole through which to steal into her puny body. On her feet she wears a pair of top boots of mud. She also walks unsteadily, first because she is meeting the wind, and secondly because her hands, too, are taken up. In her left one she carries a pair of big boots, a man's boots, her father's most likely, taking them to be mended. I need not suppose that they are going to the inn to be pawned for a bottle of brandy because of the split soles. Her father has probably come home tired out with his work. Her mother is cooking the supper, and she, the eldest daughter, has been sent out with the boots. They must be ready by tomorrow morning early. She hurries along. She knows that if her father does not get his boots by tomorrow, there will be no fire in the oven all day. She pants. The great boots are too heavy for such a little child. But the weight in her right hand is heavier, for she carries an immense journeyman's umbrella, and she carries it proudly. Her father has trusted her with it. The child needs a lot of things. In winter, warmth. Winter and summer, clothing. And all the year round, enough to eat. By way of compensation, there is excess in the size of her umbrella. I am sure that at this moment the rich lady with the parasol envies her. The little half-starved girl with the merry, roguish eyes, although the wind threatens to upset her every minute, smiles at me from out the picture. There, you see, we have our pleasures, too. As to that lady, <laughs> I am laughing at her. On paying for my unfinished glass of tea, however, I am again reminded of my little beggar boy. He has no umbrella at all. No home awaits him, not even one with dry potatoes without butter, no little bit of a bed at the foot of father's or mother's. Even the unhappy lady would not find anything to envy him for. What made me think of him again? Aha, I remember. It flashed across me that for the ten kopecks which I paid for the scarcely tasted tea, the poor little boy would have had a half portion of soup or a piece of bread and a corner to sleep in. Why did I order the tea? At home, the samovar is steaming. Somebody sits waiting for me with a ready smile. On the table, there is something to eat. I was ashamed not to order tea. Well, there is something in that, I say, to console myself. There is an even stronger wind blowing outside than before. It tears at the roofs as if it were an anti-Semite, and the roofs, Jews. But the roofs are of iron, and they are at home. It descends with fury on the lamps in the street, but they remain erect like hero sages at the time of the Inquisition. It sweeps down on the pavement, but the flags are set deep in the earth, and the earth does not let go of her dwellers so easily. Then he rises himself in anger, up! up into the height. But the heavens are afar, and the stars look down with indifference or amusement. The passers in the street bend and bow themselves, 
and huddle together to take up as little room as possible, turn round to catch their breath and pursue their certain way. But the poor, helpless little boy, I think of him with terror. What will become of him? All my philosophy has deserted me, and all my pity is awake. If it were my child, if I thought my own flesh and blood were in the grip of this wind, if my child were roaming the streets tonight, if even supposing that later on he had managed to beg a groschen, he were going in this hurricane toward Praga, footnote a suburb of Warsaw, over the Vistula, over the bridge, and just because he is not mine, is he any the less deserving? Does he feel the wind less, shiver the less with cold because his parents are lying somewhere in a grave under a tombstone? I lose all inclination to go home. I feel as if I had no right to a warm room, to the boiling samovar, to the soft bed, and above all to the smile of those who are awaiting me. It seems to me that murderer, or some such word, must be written on my forehead, that I have no business to be seen by any one. And once more I begin to think about piousness. Why the devil am I not pious, I mutter. Why need I have been the worse for believing that the one who dwells high above all the stars, high above the heavens, never lets our world out of his sight for a single instant? That not for a single instant will he forget the little boy. Why need he lie so heavy on my heart? Why cannot I leave him frankly and freely to the great heart of the universe? He would trouble me no more. I should feel him safe under the great eye of the cosmos, the eye which, should it withdraw itself for an instant, leaves whole worlds a prey to the devil, the eye which, so long as it it is open, assures to the least worm its maintenance and its right, as it is. I, with my sick chest and my wet feet, and in this weather, must go back to the soup kitchen and look for that little boy. It is a disgrace and a shame. Wherein the shame and the disgrace consisted, why and before whom I felt ashamed, to this day I do not know. And yet, on account of the shame and the disgrace, I did not take the shortest way back to the soup kitchen, but I went round by several streets. At last I arrived. The first room, the dining room, was empty. The Gehenna of daytime is cooling down. The steam rises higher and higher from the damp floor and creates a new heaven and a new firmament between the waters below, from off the feet of the poor people, and the waters above, the drops formed by the vapor. Here and there the drops come raining through. Thanks to a little window, I can see into the kitchen. The drowsy cook with the untidy head leans her left hand on the great kettle and lifts the big soup spoon lazily to her mouth. The second, the kitchen maid, is shredding macaroni for tomorrow noon. She, too, looks sleepy. The superintendent is counting meal tickets distributed by the committee. There is no one else visible. I cast a look under the tables. No trace of the little boy. I am too late. But at least, I think, as I leave the kitchen, nobody saw me. Suddenly, I remember that I have been walking the streets for several hours. Whatever is the matter with me, I mutter, and begin to pace homeward. I am quite glad to find everyone asleep. I throw off my galoshes in the entrance, steal up to my room, and into bed. But I had a bad night. Tired out, chilled, and wet through, it was long before I ceased coughing and got warm. A continual shiver ran through my bones. I did not get really to sleep till late in the morning, and then my dreams began to torment me in earnest. I started out of sleep bathed in cold perspiration, sprung out of bed and went to the window. I look out. The sky is full of stars. The stars look like diamonds set in iron. They roll on so proudly, so calmly, and so high. There is a tearing wind blowing at the back. The whole house shakes. I went back to bed, but I slept no more. I only dozed. My dreams were broken, but the little boy was the center of them all. Every time I saw him in a new place, there he lies asleep out in the street. There he crouches on some steps in an archway. Once, even, devils are playing ball with him. He flies from hand to hand through the air. Later on, I come across him lying frozen in a rubbish box. I held out till morning, and then I flew to the soup kitchen. He is there! Had I not been ashamed, I should have washed the grime off his face with tears of thankfulness. Had I not been afraid of my wife, I should have led him home as my own child. He is there. I am not his murderer. Well, and I held out a ten-kopeck piece. He takes it wondering. 
He does not know what a kindness he has done me. Long life to him. And next day, when he begged me for another groschen, I did not give him. But this time, I uttered no word of reproof. What is more, I went away ashamed, not satisfied with myself. I can really and truly not afford it. But my heart is sore. Why can I not afford it? My grandfather, on whom be peace, was not so far wrong when he used to say, Whoever is not pious lives in sorrow of heart and dies without consolation. End of section 58section fifty nine of stories and pictures this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org stories and pictures by i l perez translated by helena frank section fifty nine underground a big underground lodging room full of beds freud the tattered demalion has been asleep for some time on her chest in her corner between the stove and the wall to-day she went to bed early because to-morrow is fair day in a neighboring town and she will have to be astir betimes in order to drive there with the grease but she lies uneasy there is trouble and worry in store she had arranged with the driver to take her freud and the small barrow and now just as she was going to sleep it occurred to her that it would be better to take the big one she tosses from side to side on her couch. Plague takes a woman's tongue, she mutters, then, exclaiming against herself, The small barrel, whatever for? To please the driver? Driver be blessed. Can't he give his horses a few more oats for once? Grumbling thus over the stupidity of a woman's tongue, she has just managed to doze off. From beneath the counterpane appears a red kerchief that falls dangling round about her face and her pointed red and blue nose. She breathes heavily and presses one bony hand to her old heart. Who knows what she is dreaming? Perhaps that the driver has broken his word and she is left for a whole year without Parnosa. The opposite corner belongs to Yona, the water carrier. The wife and two children sleep in one bed and Yona with the elder cheddar boy in another. Now and then a sigh issues from the beds. Here also people have lain down in sorrow. The little chatter boy has been crying for money to pay the rabbi his fee. And the eldest daughter was left without a situation. She had been doing well as servant to a couple without children. Suddenly her mistress died. So she came home. She could not stay on alone with the widower. There were a few rubles owing to her in wages. They would have been just enough to pay the rabbi. But the widower says it is no concern of his. His wife never mentioned it, and he doesn't know. He never mixes himself up with the affairs of women. They quarreled a little before going to sleep. The mother advised going to the Jewish court. The daughter was in favor of writing a petition either to the Notchelnik, footnote, a Bible commentator of the 16th century, end of footnote, or to the Mirovoi, footnote, Russian officials, end of footnote. Yona will not hear of doing one or the other. The widower will take his revenge and get Yona a bad name among the householders. He has only to snap his fingers and there's an end of me. How many water carriers are there already loafing about with nothing to do since they started the new water supply? Beryl, the porter, all by himself in an upper bed, is snoring away like a broken-winded horse. The two children sleep together in another place. His wife is a cook and this evening she has a wedding supper on hand. Here, too, rest is broken. Beryl has an ache going through his bones, one after the other, and the eldest son sighs frequently in his sleep. He works in a lime kiln and has burnt his foot. Further on lies another snorer alone in a bed, Zarel the street seller. In the second bed sleep all three children. Her husband is a watchman. No sooner has he come in than she goes out with bread and fresh rolls. We are already in the third corner where stands another, this time an iron bedstead. A flushed, unhealthy-looking woman's head is set off by a bundle of rags that serve as a pillow. Her prematurely parched lips open frequently and a heavy sigh escapes them. Her husband's profession is a hard one, and he has no luck. Last week, at the risk of his life, he conveyed away a copper kettle and buried it in the sand outside the town. 
and it was discovered. Who knows what he will bring home tonight? Perhaps he is already in jail. It is three weeks since she sat on to boil so much as a kettle full of water, and they are clamoring for the rent. A hard life and no luck, sighed the parched lips, and one has to be on one's guard against neighbors. They are always asking, what is your husband's trade? What keeps him out so late? Over all the beds flickers a pale light from the center of the room. It rises from between four canvas walls that bound the kingdom of a young married couple. Trenny, the young housewife, is still awake. She has only been married two months, and she is waiting for her husband, who will presently return from the house of study. The oil lamp is burning and throws pale patches on the blackened ceiling. A few feeble rays come through the rents in the canvas walls, and dance upon the beds with the poor, worn-out faces. In Trenny's kingdom, all is brighter and cleaner. Between the two beds, on a little white table, lies a prayer book flanked by two little metal candlesticks. Her wedding gifts, wedding garments, hang on the wall, also a talus bag with the shield of David embroidered on it. But there are no chairs in the kingdom. Trenny sits on one of the beds, making a net to hold the onions which are lying beside her, scattered over the sheet. The soup for supper is keeping hot under the bedclothes. The door of the big room opens softly. Trenny's cheeks flush. She lets the net fall out of her hands and springs off the bed. But then she remains standing. It would never do before all the neighbors. One of them might wake and she would never hear the last of it. The neighbors are bad enough as it is, especially Freud. Freud cannot understand a wife not beginning to scold her husband the next day after the wedding. Just you wait, she says. The old cat, you'll see the life he'll lead you when it's too late. Freud leaves her no peace. A husband, she says, who is not led by the nose is worse than a wolf. He sucks the marrow out of your bones, the blood out of your veins. It is ten years now since Freud had a husband, and she has not got her strength back yet. And Freud is a clever woman. She knows a lot. Anything that he has a right to, she says, fling it out to him as you would a bone to a dog. And Trenny has time to recollect all this because it is some minutes before Yosel manages to steal on tiptoe past all the beds. Every step he takes echoes at her heart. But as to go out to meet him, not for any money. There, he nearly fell. Now he is just outside the partition walls. She breathes again. Good evening he says in a low voice with downcast eyes. A good year to you, she answers, lower still. Then are you hungry, she asks. Are you? Wait. He slips out between the partitions and returns with washed and dripping hands. She gives him a towel. On a corner of the table there is some bread and some salt and the now uncovered soup. He sits down on his bed, on the top of all the bedclothes, she on hers, with the onions. They eat slowly talking with their eyes. What about, do you think? And with their lips about the way to earn a living. Well, how are you getting on? Oh, he sighs, three pupils already. And that is all we have to depend on, she asks sadly. Ma, he answers with gentle reproach. God be praised, she is consoling herself and him together. God be praised, that only makes one hundred and twenty roubles, he sighs. Well, why do you sigh? Add it up, he answers, one ruble a week rent. That's twenty-six rubles a season. And then I'm in debt. There were wedding expenses. What do you mean? she asked, astonished. He smiles. Silly little thing. My father couldn't afford to give us anything more than his consent. Well, what do they come to altogether? she interrupts. Altogether, he goes on, twelve rubles. That makes thirty-eight. What remains over for food? She calculates. Eighty-two, I suppose, for twenty-six weeks. Well, after all, she says, it's over three rubles a week. And what? He asks sadly. What about wood and candles, Sabbaths and holidays? That God is faithful, she tries to cheer him. And I can do something, too. Look, I have bought some onions. Eggs are very cheap. I will buy some eggs, too. In a week or so, perhaps five dozen eggs will yield a little profit. But just calculate, he persists. 
what we must spend on firing and lights. Why, next to nothing. Perhaps one ruble a week, that leaves us. And Sabbaths and holidays. Child, what are you thinking of? And the word child falls so softly, so kindly from his lips that she must needs smile. Come, say the blessing quick, she says, and let other things be till tomorrow. It's time to go to sleep. Then she feels ashamed, lowers her eyelids, and says, as if she were excusing herself, You come so late, with a yawn it is half a sham. He leans toward her across the little table. Silly child, he whispers, I come in late on purpose so that we may eat together. Do you see? For a teacher you know it is not the thing. Well, well, say the blessing, she repeats, shutting her eyes tighter closes his he wants to say it seriously but his eyes keep opening of themselves he presses down his eyelids but there remains a chink through which he sees her in a strangely colored light so that he cannot do otherwise than look at her she is tired he feels sorry for her he sees her trying to sit further back on the bed and letting her head rest against the wall she will go to sleep like that he thinks why not take a pillow, he would like to say, almost crossly, but he cannot. <clears throat> <clears throat> she doesn't hear. He hurries through the blessing, finishes it, stands up, and there remains, not knowing what to do next. Jenny, he calls, but so low it could not wake her. He goes up to her bed and bends over her. Her face smiles. It looks so sweet. She must be dreaming of something pleasant. How beautifully she smiles. It would be a shame to wake her. Only her little head will hurt. Oy, what hair she must have had. He has looked at her curls, long black hair, all shorn now. Footnote, as beseemed an orthodox married Jewess, end of footnote. Her cap is a thin embroidered one, with holes. She is a beauty. He smiles too. But she must be woke. He bends lower and feels her breath. He draws it in hastily. She attracts him like a magnet. Half unconsciously, he touches her lips with his own. I wasn't asleep at all, she said suddenly, and opens a pair of mischievous laughing eyes. She throws her arms round his shoulders and pulls him down to her. Never mind, she whispers into his ear, and her voice is very sweet. Never mind. God is good and will help us. Was it not he who brought us together? He will not forsake us. There will be firing and lights. There will be enough to live on. It will be all right. Everything will be right, won't it, Yosel? Yes, it will. He makes no reply. He is trembling all over. She pushes him a little further away. Look at me, Yosel. It occurs to her to say. Yosel wishes to obey and cannot. Poor wretch, she says gently. Not accustomed to it yet, huh? He wants to hide his head in her breast, but she will not allow him to. Why are you ashamed, wretch? You can kiss, but you won't look. He would rather kiss her, but she will not allow him. Please look at me. Yosel opens his eyes wide, but not for long. Oh, please, she says, and her voice is softer, silkier than ever. He looks. This time it is her lids that fall. Just tell me, she says, only please tell me the truth. Am I a pretty woman? Yes, he whispers, and she feels his hot breath on her cheek. Who told you? Can't I see for myself? You are a queen, a, a queen. And tell me yourself, she continues, shall you be always just as, just the same? What do you mean by that, Jenny? I mean, her voice shakes, just as fond of me. What a question. Just as dear. What next? Always. Always, he is confident. Shall you always eat with me? Of course, he answers. And and you will never scold me? Never. Never make me unhappy. Unhappy? I? You? What do you mean? Why? I don't know. Freud says. What, the witch? He draws nearer to her. She pushes him back. Yosel, what is it? Tell me, what is my name? Trenny. Fay. The small mouth makes a motion of disgust. Tren is she, he corrects himself. She is not pleased yet. Tren and you? No. Well then, Trenny my life? Trenny my crown? Trenny my heart? Will that do? 
Yes, she answers happily, only. What now, my life, my delight? Only listen, Yosel, and she stammers, and what? And when, if you should be out of work any time, and when I am not earning much, then perhaps, perhaps you will scold. The tears come into her eyes. God forbid, God forbid. He forces his head out of her hands and flings himself upon her parted lips. Plague take you all together, head and hands and feet. A voice comes from beneath the partition. Honeymooning as I'm alive, there's no closing an eye. It is the husky, acidly spiteful voice of Freud, the tattered Demalion. End of section 59. Section 60 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Violet Blue of Albertville. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 60. Between Two Mountains. Between the Rabbi of Brisk and the Rebbe of Biala, a Simcha Stora tale, told by an old teacher. Part One. Of course, you have heard of the Brisk Rabbi and the Biala Rebbe, but it is not every one who knows that the holy man of Biala, Reb Noachke, was at one time the Brisk Rabbi's pupil that he studied a good couple of years with him, then disappeared for another two, and finally emerged from his voluntary exile as a distinguished man in Biala. And he left for this reason. They studied the Torah with the brisk rabbi, only the Rebbe felt that it was dry Torah. For instance, one learns about questions regarding women, or about meat in milk, or else about a money matter. Very well. Reuben and Simone come with a dispute, or there comes a maidservant or a woman with a question of ritual, and that very moment the study becomes a delight. It is alive and is there for a purpose. But like this, without them, the Rebbe felt the Torah, that is, the body of the Torah, the explanation, what lies on the surface, is dry. That, he felt, is not the law of life. Torah must live. The study of Kabbalah books was not allowed in Brisk. The brisk rabbi was a misnagid, and by nature revengeful and relentless as a serpent. If anyone ventured to open a zohar, the pardis, he would scold and put him under a ban. Somebody was caught reading a Kabbalah book, and the rabbi had his beard shaven by Gentiles. What do you think? The man became distraught, fell into a melancholy, and what is more wonderful, no good Jew was able to help him. The brisk rabbi was no trifle, I can tell you. And how was anyone just to get up and go away from his academy? Reb Noachke couldn't make up his mind what to do for a long time. Then he was shown a dream. He dreamed that the brisk rabbi came in to him and said, Come, Noach, I will take you into the terrestrial garden of Eden. And he took his hand and led him away thither. They came into a great palace. There were no doors and no windows in this palace, except for the door by which they came in. And yet it was light, for the walls, as it seemed to the Rebbe, were of crystal and gave out a glittering shine. And so they went on, further and further, and one saw no end to it. Hold on to my skirt, said the brisk Rabbi. There are halls without doors and without number, and if you let go of me, you will be lost forever. The Rebbe obeyed, and they went further and further, and the whole way he saw no bench, no chair, no kind of furniture, nothing at all. There is no resting here, explained the brisk rabbi. One goes on and on, and he followed, and every hall was longer and brighter than the last, and the walls shone now with this color, and now with that, here with several, and there with all colors, but they did not meet a single human being on their way. The Rebbe grew weary walking. He was covered with perspiration, a cold perspiration. He drew cold in every limb, beside which his eyes began to hurt him from the continual brilliancy. And then came over him a great longing, a longing after Jews, after companions, after all Israel. It was no trifle not meeting a single soul. Long after no one, said the brisk rabbi, this is a palace for me and for you, and you will also some day be rabbi of brisk. And the other was more terrified than ever, and laid his hand against the wall to help himself from falling. 
and the wall burnt him, only not as fire burns, but as ice burns. Rabbi, he gave a cry, the walls are ice, simply ice. The brisk rabbi was silent, and the other cried again, Rabbi, take me away, hence, I do not wish to stay alone with you, I wish to be with all Israel. And hardly had he said it when the brisk rabbi disappeared and he was left alone in the palace. He knew of no way, no in and no out. A cold terror struck him from the walls, and the longing for a Jew, to see a Jew. If only a cobbler or a tailor waxed stronger and stronger, he began to weep. Lord of the world, he begged, take me away from here, better in Gehenna with all Israel than here one by himself. And immediately there appeared before him a common Jew with the red sash of a driver around him, and a long whip in his hand. The Jew took him silently by the sleeve, led him out of the palace, and vanished. Such was the dream that was sent him. When he woke before daylight, when it had scarcely begun to dawn, he understood that this had been no ordinary dream. He dressed quickly and hastened toward the house of study, to get his dream interpreted by the learned ones who passed the night there. On his way through the market, however, he saw a covered wagon standing, then beside it the driver with a red sash round the waist, a long whip in his hand, and altogether just such a Jew as the one who had led him out of the palace in his dream. Noach, it struck him there was something behind the coincidence, went up to him and asked, Whither drives a Jew? Not your way, answered the driver very roughly. Well, tell me anyway, he continued, perhaps I will go with you. The driver considered a little and then answered, And can't a young fellow like you go on foot? he asked. Go along with you, your way. And whither shall I go? Follow your nose, answered the driver. It is not my business. The Rebbe understood, and now began his exile. A few years later, as before said, into publicity in Biala. How it all happened, I won't tell you now, although it's enough to make anyone open his mouth and ears. And about a year after this happened, a Biala householder, Reb Yehiel, his name was, sent for me as a teacher. At first I would not accept the post of teacher in his house. You must know that Reb Yehiel was a rich man of the old-fashioned type. He gave his daughters a thousand gold pieces dowry, and contracted alliances with the greatest rabbis, and his latest daughter-in-law was a daughter of the rabbi of Brisk. You can see for yourself that if the brisk rabbi and the other connections were Miznagdim, Reb Yehiel had to be a Miznagid too. And I am a Biale Chosid. Well, how could I go into a house of that kind? And yet I felt drawn to Biale. You can fancy the idea of living in the same town as the Rebbe. After a good deal of seesawing, I went. And Reb Yehiel himself turned out to be a very honest, pious Jew, and I tell you, his heart was drawn to the Rebbe as if with pincers. He was no learned man himself, and he stared at the Rabbi of Brisk as a cock looks at a prayer book. He made no objections to my holding to the Biali Rebbe, only he would have nothing to do with him himself. And when I told him, when I told anything about the Rebbe, he would pretend to yawn, and I could see that he pricked up his ears, but his son, the son-in-law of the brisk rabbi, would frown and look at me with mingled anger and contempt, only he never argued, he was silent by nature. And it came to pass on a day that Reb Yehiel's daughter-in-law, the brisk rabbi's daughter, was expecting the birth of her first child. Well, there is nothing new in that, you say, but thereby hangs a tale. It was well known that the brisk rabbi, because he had shaved a chosid, that is, caused him to be deprived of beard and earlocks, was made to suffer by the prominent rebbes. Both his sons, not of you be it said, died within five or six years, and not one of his three daughters had a boy, besides which every child they bore nearly cost them their life. Everyone saw and knew that it was a visitation of the great rebbes on the brisk rabbi. Only he himself, for all his clear-sightedness, did not see it. He went on his way as before, carrying on his opposition by means of force and bands. I was really sorry for Gutella, that was the name of the rabbi's daughter, really sorry. First, a Jewess, secondly, a good Jewess, such a good, kind soul as was never known. Not a poor girl was married without her assistance, a silken creature, and she was to be punished for her father's outburst of anger. And therefore, as soon as I heard the midwife busy in the room, I wanted to move heaven and earth for them to send to the Biala Rebbe. 
if only a note without a money offering after all it wasn't as if he needed money the biala rebbe never thought much of money but whom was i to speak with i tried on with the brisk rabbi's son-in-law and i know very well that his soul is bound up with her soul that he has never hid from himself that domestic happiness shone out of every corner out of every word and deed but he is the brisk rabbi's son-in-law he spits goes away and leaves me standing with my mouth open i go to reb yehiel himself and he answers it is the brisk rabbi's daughter i could not treat him like that not even if there was peril of death heaven forbid i try his wife a worthy soul but a simple one and she answers if my husband told me to do so i would send the rebbe my holiday headkerchief and the earrings at once they cost a mint of money but without his consent not a copper farthing not a tassel but a note what harm could a note do without my husband's knowledge nothing she answers as a good jewess should answer and turns away from me and i see that she only does it to hide her tears a mother the heart knows her heart has felt the danger but when i heard the first cry i ran to the rebbe myself shemaya he answered me what can i do i will pray give me something for her rebbe i implore anything a coin a trifle an amulet it would only make matters worse which heaven forbid he replied where there is no faith such things only do harm and she would have none what could i do it was the first day of tabernacles there was nothing i could do for her i might as well stay with the rebbe i was like a son of the house i thought i will look imploringly at the rebbe every minute perhaps he will have compassion one heard things were not going on well everything had been done graves measured hundreds of candles burnt in the synagogue in the house of study and a fortune given away in charity what remains to be told all the wardrobes stood open a great heap of coins of all sorts lay on the table and the poor people came in and took away all who wished what they wished as much as they wished i felt it all deeply rebbe i said it is written almsgiving delivers from death and he answered quite away from the matter perhaps the brisk rabbi will come and in that instant there walks in reb yehiel he never spoke to the rebbe any more than if he hadn't seen him shemaya he says to me and catches hold of the flap of my coat there is a cart outside go get into it and drive to the brisk rabbi tell him to come and he was evidently quite aware of what was involved for he answered let him see for himself what it means let him say what is to be done and he looked what am i to say a corpse is more beautiful than he was well i set off and thinking i thought to myself if rebbe knows that the brisk rabbi expects to come here something will result perhaps they will make peace that is not the brisk rabbi with the biala rebbe for they themselves were not at strife but their followers because really if he comes he will see us he has eyes in his head but heaven it seems will not suffer such things to come to pass so quickly and set hindrances in my way hardly had i driven out of biala when a cloud spread itself out over the sky and what a cloud a heavy black cloud like soot and there came a gust of wind as though spirits were flying abroad and it blew from all sides at once a peasant of course understands these things he crossed himself and said that the journey might heaven defend us would be hard and pointed with his whip to the sky just then came a stronger gust of wind tore the cloud as you tear a piece of paper and began to blow one bit of it to one side and one to the other as if it were parting ice flows on a river i had two or three piles of cloud over my head i wasn't at all frightened at first it was no new thing for me to be wet through and i am not alarmed at thunder it never thunders at tabernacles and secondly after the rebbe's shofar blowing we have a tradition that after the shofar blowing thunder has no power to harm for a whole year but when the rain suddenly gave a lash across the face like a whip once twice thrice my heart sank into my shoes i saw that heaven was against me driving me back and the peasant too begged let us go home but i knew there was peril of death 
I sat on the cart and heard through the storm the moans of the woman and the crack of the husband's finger joints. He wrings his hands, and I see Reb Yahil's dark face with the sunken, burning eyes. Drive on, he says. Drive on, and we drive on. And it pours and pours. It pours from above and splashes from below, from underneath the wheels and the horse's feet, and the road is swamped, literally covered with water. The water frothed. The cart seemed to swim. What am I to tell you? Besides that, we lost our way, but I lived through it. I brought back the brisk rabbi by the great Hosanna. End of section 60 Recording by Violet Blue of Albertville Section 61 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Violet Blue of Albertville. Between Two Mountains. Between the Rabbi of Brisk and the Rebbe of Biale. A Simkas Torah Tale. Told by an Old Teacher. Part 2. I must tell you the truth, that no sooner had the brisk rabbi taken his seat in the cart than it grew still. The cloud broke up and the sun shone through the rift, and we drove into Biale quite dry and comfortable. Even the peasant remarked it and said in his own language, A great rabbi! A powerful rabbi! But the main thing was our arrival in Biale. The women who were in the house crowded to the rabbi like locusts. They nearly fell on their faces before him and wept. The daughter in the inner room was not heard, either because of the women's weeping, or else because she had no strength left to complain. Reb Yehiel did not see us. He was standing with his forehead pressed against a window-pane, as though his head were burning hot. The brisk rabbi's son-in-law did not turn around to greet us, either. He stood with his face against the wall, and I could see plainly how his whole body shook, and how his head knocked against the wall. I thought I should have fallen. Anxiety and terror had taken such hold on me that I was cold in every limb. I felt that my soul was chilled. Well, did you know the brisk rabbi? That was a man. A pillar of iron, I tell you. A tall, tall man, from his shoulders and upward. He was higher than any of the people. He cast awe around him like a king. A long white beard, one point of it I remember now, had tucked itself under his girdle, the other point quivered over it. His eyebrows were white, thick and long. They seemed to cover part of his face. When he raised them, Lord of the world! The women fell back as though they were thunderstruck. He had such eyes! There were daggers in them, glittering daggers, and he gave a roar like a lion. Women, be gone! And then he asked in a lower and gentler voice, And where is my daughter? They showed him. He went in and remained standing, quite upset. Such eyes, such a voice! It is quite another sort, another world. The Biala Rebbe's eyes are so kind, so quiet, that they do one's heart good. He gives you a look, and it's like a shower of gold. And his voice, that sweet voice, soft as velvet, Lord of the world. It goes to your heart, and it soothes and comforts it. One isn't afraid of him, heaven forbid. The soul just melts for love of him. She desires to escape from the body and unite herself to his soul. She is drawn as a butterfly, le havdil, to a bright flame. And here, lord of the world, fear and trembling, a gown of the old days, and he has gone to a woman in childbed. He will turn her into a heap of bones, I think, in terror. I run to the Biali Rebbe, and he met me in the door with a smile. Have you seen, he said to me, the majesty of the law? The very majesty of the law? I felt relieved. If the Rebbe smiles, I thought, all will be well. And all was well. On Shemini Asteris, she was over it. And on Simkas Torah, the brisk rabbi, presided at table. I would have liked to be at table somewhere else, but I did not dare go away, particularly as I had made up the tenth man needed to recite grace. Well... What am I to tell you? How the brisk rabbi expounded the Torah? If the Torah is a sea, he was Leviathan in the sea. 
with one twist of his tail he swam through ten treatises with another he mixed together the talmud and the codes so that it heaved and splashed and seethed and boiled just as they say the real sea does he made my head go round but the heart knoweth its own bitterness and my heart felt no holiday happiness and then i remembered the rebbe's dream and i felt petrified there was sun in the window and no want of wine at table i could see the whole company was perspiring and i i was cold cold as ice over yonder i knew the torah was being expounded differently there it is bright and warm every word is penetrated and interwoven with love and rapture one feels that angels are flying through the room one seems to hear the rustle of the great white wings ay lord of the world only there's no getting away suddenly he stops the brisk rabbi and asks what kind of rabbi have you got here a certain noach they reply will it cut me to the heart a certain noach oh the flattery the flattery of it is he a wonder worker not very much of one one doesn't often hear about him the women talk of him but who listens to them then he just takes money and does nothing wonderful they tell him the truth that he takes little money and gives away a great deal the rabbi muses and he is a scholar they say a great one whence is he this noach nobody knows and i have to answer a conversation ensues between me and the brisk rabbi was he not once in brisk this noach he asks was not the rebbe once in brisk i, I stammered i i th i think yes ah says he a follower of his and it seems to me he looks at me as one looks at a spider then he turns to the company i once had a pupil he says noach he had a good head but he was attracted to the other side i spoke to him once twice i would have spoken to him a third time to warn him but he disappeared is it not he who knows and he began to describe him thin small a little black beard curly earlocks a dreamer a quiet voice and so on it may be said the company that it is he it sounds very like i thank god when they began to say grace but after grace something happened that i had never dreamt of the brisk rabbi rises from his seat calls me aside and says in a low voice take me to your rebbe and my pupil only do you hear no one must know of course i obeyed only on the way i asked in terror brisk rabbi tell me with what purpose are you going and he answered simply it occurred to me at grace that i had judged by hearsay i want to see i want to see for myself and perhaps he added after a while god will help me and i will save a pupil of mine no rascal he said to me playfully that if your rebbe is that noach who studied with me he may some day be a great man in israel a veritable brisk rabbi then i knew that it was he and my heart began to beat with violence and the two mountains met and it is a miracle from heaven that i was not crushed between them the biala rebbe of blessed memory used to send out his followers at, at simkas torah to walk round the town and he himself sat in the balcony and looked on and had pleasure in what he saw it was not the biala of to-day it was quite a small place then with little low-built houses except for the shul and the rebbe's klaus the rebbe's balcony was on the second floor and you could see everything from it as if it all lay in the flat of your hand the hills to the east and the river to the west and the rebbe sits and looks out sees some hasidim walking along in silence and throws down to them from the balcony the fragments of a tune they catch at it and proceed on their way singing and batches and batches of them go past and out of the town with songs and real gladness with real rejoicing of the law and the rebbe used not to leave the balcony but on this occasion the rebbe must have heard other steps for he rose and came to meet the rabbi of brisk peace be with you rabbi he said meekly in his sweet voice peace be with you noach the brisk rabbi answered sit rabbi the brisk rabbi took a seat and the biala rebbe stood before him tell me noach said the brisk rabbi with lifted eyebrows why did you run away from my academy what was wanting to you there breathing space rabbi answered the other composedly 
What do you mean? What are you talking about, Noach? Not for myself, explained the Biala Rebbe in a quiet tone. It was for my soul. Why so, Noach? Your Torah, Rabbi, is all justice. It is without mercy. There is not a spark of grace in your Torah, and therefore it is joyless and cannot breathe freely. It is all chains and fetters, iron regulations, copper laws, and all higher Torah for the learned, for the select few. The brisk rabbi is silent, and the other continues, And tell me, rabbi, what have you for all Israel? What have you, rabbi, for the woodcutter, for the butcher, for the artisan, for the common Jew, especially for the simple Jew? Rabbi, what have you for the unlearned? The brisk rabbi is silent, as though he did not understand what was being said to him, and still the Bialy rabbi stands before him and goes on in his sweet voice, Forgive me, rabbi, but I must tell the truth. Your Torah was hard, hard and dry, for it is only the body and not the soul of the law. The soul? asks the brisk rabbi and rubs his high forehead. Certainly, as I told you, rabbi, your Torah is for the select, for the learned not for all Israel. And the Torah must be for all Israel. The Divine Presence must rest on all Israel, because the Torah is the soul of all Israel. And your Torah, Noach? You wish to see it, Rabbi? Torah? See it? wonders the brisk Rabbi. Come, Rabbi, I will show it you. I will show you its splendor, the joy which beams forth from it upon all, upon all Israel. The brisk rabbi does not move. I beg of you, rabbi, come, it is not far. He led him out onto the balcony, and I went quietly after. You may come too, Shemaiah, he said to me. Today you will see it also, and the brisk rabbi will see. You will see the Simkas Torah. You will see real rejoicing of the law. And I saw what I had always seen, only I saw it differently, as if a curtain had fallen from my eyes. A great wide sky, without a limit. The sky was so blue, so blue. It was a delight to the eye. Little white clouds, silvery clouds, floated across it. And when you looked at them intently, you saw how they quivered for joy, how they danced for rejoicing in the law. Away behind, the town was encircled by a broad green girdle, a dark green one. Only the green lived, as though something alive were flying along through the grass, Every now and then it seemed as if a living being, a sweet smell, a little life, darted up shining in a different place. One could see plainly how the little flames sprang up and danced and embraced each other. And over the fields, with the flames, there sauntered parties and parties of Hasidim. The satin and even the satinette cloaks shine like glass, torn ones, and the whole alike. And the little flames that rose from the grass attached themselves to the shining holiday garments and seemed to dance round every Hasid with delight and affection. And every company of Hasidim gazed up with wonderfully thirsty eyes at Rebbe's balcony. And I could see how that thirsty gaze of theirs sucked light from the balcony, from the Rebbe's face and the more light they sucked in the louder they sang louder and louder more cheerfully more devoutly and every company sang to its own tune but all the different tunes and voices blended in the air and there floated up to the rebbe's balcony one strain one melody as though all were singing one song and everything sang the sky the celestial bodies the earth beneath the soul of the world itself everything was singing Lord of the world, I thought, I should dissolve away for sheer delight, but it was not meant to be. It is time for the afternoon prayers, said the brisk rabbi suddenly in a sharp tone, and it all vanished. Silence. The curtain has fallen back across my eyes. Above is the usual sky, below the usual fields, the usual Hasidim in torn cloaks, old disconnected fragments of song. The flames are extinguished. I glance at the Rebbe. His face is darkened, too. They were not reconciled. The brisk rabbi remained a misnagid as before, but it had one result. He never persecuted again. End of section 61 Recording by Violet Blue of Albertville Section 62 of Stories and Pictures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Stories and Pictures by I. L. Peretz. Translated by Helena Frank. Section 62. The Image. Great people have been known to do great wonders. Witness the time when they attacked the ghetto in Prague, and were about to assault the women, roast the children, and beat the remainder to death. When all means of defense were exhausted, the Mahabral, footnote, the great rabbi Loeb, who lived in the 16th century and who became the central figure of many a legend, end of footnote, laid down the Gemara stepped out into the street and went up to the first mud heap outside the door of a schoolmaster and made a clay image he blew into its nostril and it began to move then he whispered a name into its ear and away went the image out of the ghetto and the maharal sat down again to his book the image fell upon her enemies who were besieging the ghetto and threshed them as it were with flails they fell before him as thick as flies Prague was filled with corpses. They say the destruction lasted all Wednesday and Thursday. Friday, at noon, the image was still at it. Rabbi, exclaimed Cahol, the image is making a clean sweep of the city. There will be no one left to light the fires on Sabbath or to take down the lamps. Footnote. No Gentile to be hired for that purpose. End of footnote. A second time, the Maharal shut his book. He took his stand at the desk and began to chant the psalm, a song of the Sabbath day. Whereupon the image ceased from work, came back to the ghetto, entered the synagogue, and approached the Maharal. The Maharal whispered into its ear as before. Its eyes closed, the breath left it, and became once more a clay image. And to this day the image lies aloft in the Prague synagogue, covered up with cobwebs that stretch across from wall to wall and spread over the whole arcade, so that the image shall not be seen, above all not by the pregnant women of the women's court, and the cobwebs may not be touched, whoever touches them dies. No man, not the oldest there, recollects having seen the image, but the Shasham Zebai, the Maharal's grandson, sometimes wonders whether, for instance, such an image might not be included in one of the ten males, required to form a congregation the image you see is not forgotten the image is there still but the name with which to give it life in the day of need has fallen as it were into a deep water and the cobwebs increase and increase and one may not touch them what is to be done end of section sixty two end of stories and pictures by i l Peretz. translated by helena frank